Do you think the whole red pill community hates women? There was one stream where you were doing where you see like Fauci, for example, he's talking about the importance of vaccines. Uh, he personally takes something like 20 milli or I think grams of vitamin D. Like he, he takes, in one interview he revealed, he takes a lot of vitamin D. I'm pretty Even sure that when you rank like the top 10 states that have gotten fucked by the virus, I think like eight or nine of them are conservative. Here's like the top 10 states deaths per 1 million, right? Top 10. So number one is Mississippi, then Arizona, Alabama, Tennessee, West Virginia, New Jersey, Arkansas, Louisiana, Michigan, Oklahoma, then New York, Georgia, New Mexico, Indiana, uh, like Pennsylvania is blue, South Carolina, Florida, Kentucky. Like I, it seems like of the top 20, I feel like 15 of these states are pretty solidly red states. Um, just looking at like the deaths per 1 million people, but. Yeah, but like if you. My name is Stephen Bunnell. I go online by Destiny. Um, I do like politics slash gaming stuff uh, and i consider myself like center left far left i guess depending on who i'm talking to mm -hmm. yeah man i really respect that you do debates there's actually surprisingly very few people who are willing to have honest like open-ended good faith discussions mm -hmm. yeah. um, so i was watching that a lot for your channel and you also seem to uh be down to do like 10 versus one debates so respect for that. My name is Alex. Uh, I run the channel called Playing With Fire. We practice, We basically do straightforward, no bullshit dating advice. So we give you guys the raw truth. We don't bullshit. We don't sugarcoat things. And we'll also talk about a whole bunch of other shit, including trolling black pillars. And we have some fun with it. Um, so that's the, uh, yeah, that's the thing about me. So I'm excited for this debate because lately I've been doing, uh, I've been debating a lot of black pillars. And their main argument is always, looks are the only things that matter, bro. Everything else is cool. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to be able to have um, a good nuanced discussion. Um, so let's start with this. How did you get started? Uh, let's do a little more like detailed background. Like how did you get started with your channel? Um, and what's like your background? Um, that's a really long story. I've been streaming professionally now for like 10, like 12 years, I think actually. Um, but basically the long and short of it is long time ago, I started playing StarCraft II. That was like the game that people streamed. I streamed that. Um, and then over time, my channel kind of like evolved to deal with like politics, social issues, psychology, philosophy, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I think today I'm probably mainly known for like political stuff. Mm -hmm. Would you say you're a natural? Uh, at what? Um, depends on what you mean by that. <laughs> like, were you were you pretty good growing up with girls? Did you lose your virginity fairly early on in life? Were you just always you kind of had it handled or is it something you really had to learn as you got older? Um, I mean, I would say that like, I don't like the term, maybe this will be our first disagreement. I don't like the term natural because like, um, like I think I've been good at it for quite a while, but I think I've like practiced a lot of like social skills for a long time. You just don't realize that you're practicing them like in grade school or high school. So sure. like, I've always been like pretty confident. I've always been like pretty funny. Um, I don't think I lost my virginity at like an exceptionally early age. Like it was like 16 or 17. So like, I wasn't like, crazy. fairly early. I was 19. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, I mean, you know, term aside, I would probably say based on that, you kind of fall into that category. I guess someone who's not natural would be someone that like really struggled for a while. And then they started like reading some books, learn, you know, found my channel or whatever. And they learn game that way versus kind of figuring it out on their own. Mm -hmm. That would be the uh, big distinction. Um, before we get started, also one more question I want to ask totally random. How did you get verified on Instagram? Um, I think I literally just filled out the thing. <laughs> Okay. Oh, there's like a, I think there's like a thing on your, if you have a business account, there's like a thing for like, fill this out for verification. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That gives me some hope. So like, I figured, I think we'll start off by just going through some of the things we agree on. Uh, we'll kind of go through it quick and then we can kind of flesh out some things that we disagree on. Uh, so I was watching your Abin Preach video when they did a reaction to you. Mm -hmm. And um, so my analysis was this, this is the things that we agree on. Uh, be limited in talking about yourself. So you made a point that no one gives a shit about your whole life story, unless you're a really good storyteller. So yeah, and I'm then in that case, they don't even really care about you. They just like the entertainment, the story, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Like, but not a lot of people actually say that or know this. But yeah, like people love talking about themselves, mm -hmm. especially women or people in general. And they like, anybody, you know, any. There's like there are so many. If you have that one piece of advice, you can actually apply that to a lot of different things um, in life. If, if there's like a person that, uh, like, if you're having trouble with a coworker. Uh, if you ask them like, hey, like, I don't understand this thing. Can you show me how it works? Like that type of thing, like just immediately makes people like you. I remember using that once at a, I had, like this coworker that fucking was just, he just didn't like me for some reason. I was the new guy and I was like kind of up and coming. And I, I would just ask him for tips on things. Usually shit I already knew, but it, he, it made him feel like really good to like, yeah, I can tell you, I can show you this. Like just shit like that. Like people really like stuff like that. Yeah. People love that. Have you read 48 Laws of Power? 
I have not. Okay, because they talk about that in that book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, the other thing I agreed on, don't ever come off desperate. That's like an instant uh, pussy killer. Like never come off desperate like you need it. Like you need to get laid. And Desperation uh, is like, the, that's like the black pill of the black pill. I think you can take like the hottest, most successful guy in the world that is a multi-billionaire, looks fucking hot as fuck. And if he comes off as desperate, I think he can actually lose on, on in ways that people wouldn't imagine. It is like, it's probably like one of the most important things to keep in mind. Um, now, I don't know how far you take it in terms of like the game playing and the hard to get and all that yeah. and the chase or whatever, but I do know that you have to be pretty. And I say like, you really don't have to be like overly cautious about it, but then the person that needs to hear this probably does need to be overly cautious about it. It just depends on who you are. But yeah, if you're the kind of person who like you, you, you leave somebody and you had a good date and like three minutes later, you're texting their phone like 15 times, like you're like never going to see that person again, probably. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good point. I see this. I live in Miami. I see this all the time. Like I'll go out with girls and they'll tell me stories, you know, about like some guy that they used to whatever went on a date with or they saw. And like the one they described the guy, he's like multimillionaire, like super Jack, like he hits all the check boxes of being higher value than me. So they're all like the natural question is like, okay, well, why are you not with him? And it's always like, well, then he like fucking stood outside my apartment for four hours and begged me to come outside. So it's Mm -hmm. always like a lot of these guys that I think the Red Pill community idolizes and think should naturally be successful are actually really struggling because they're coming off super desperate and needy. Mm -hmm. And like rich people are not immune to this. There's a lot of very lonely, needy rich people. Mm -hmm. So I think on that. And the last point is nervousness, unless you're normally confident, is a massive turnoff to women. So I agree with that as well. Uh, Some women, like some people say, oh, it's cute when you're nervous. But that's only if you're like a naturally confident person. So I thought that was a good point that you made there. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so let's get into let's get into the bread and butter of it. So let me start off with this question to kind of flesh out your ideas. Yeah, what sure. specifically do you agree and disagree with the red pill or pickup community on? Um, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. I'm probably overgeneralizing, obviously, because I haven't oh, engaged with specifically any of your content. Usually, the way that red pill or black pill communities work is they have these descriptions of reality that contain these nuggets of truth in them that are definitely like true. But then they run off like into these insane areas with them that I don't think they need to go to. Um, I'm trying to think if I can think of an example of this. Fuck, I'm sure it'll come up in the conversation. But like, I I think that when you engage with human beings, I think that like you treat everybody, men and women, as like pretty selfish creatures. They're kind of just looking to satisfy the things that they're looking for. And as long as you're navigating the world aware of that, you can play into that hopefully not in a manipulative way, but you can play into that like pretty easily and you can do well in social situations. Um, The thing that gets a little bit weird is when people will take that kind of natural selfish bend of most people and they make it into this really malicious thing. Like women are looking to, rather than like a woman is probably looking for somebody that can provide some level of financial security, like looks okay, it's fun to be around, like pretty basic, but this will get twisted into like um, women are the master cock carousel riders that are looking for the biggest money bag that she can find until she can dump you and leave for that. Like, it'll be like really insane shit. It's like, damn man. Like, I don't know if I would like load it that that intensely, but that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. You just go a little bit too far with it. Yeah, man. I mean, I don't even natural and uh, you know necessarily disagree with any of that. Is there anything specific that comes to your mind that you hear guys in the Red Pill community talking about that you're like, nope, I disagree with this? Um, I, not that I can think of off the top of my head. It's been a long time since I've spent any time reading anything from these communities. They've kind of they had their big blow up. I think it was like 2018, 2019, kind of like in conjunction with all the other like online conservative stuff. I'm not saying they are, but I haven't engaged with any Red Pill communities in quite a while. Okay, I'm sure some stuff will come up as we kind of go through the question. Okay, do you think the whole Red Pill community hates women? There was one stream where you were doing where you sort of hinted at it, but I couldn't tell if you were being sarcastic, so I kind of want to flesh out your idea on this. Um, It's really hard sometimes to tell. Um, There's like two things that are either going on. Is is one, the communities end up, I think what happens is, if I'm going to give like the best good faith interpretation, I think what happens is, is if you spend any time in a community with a certain type of person, you're likely to like, make a certain type of joke or have a certain type of humor. And then over time, you start to attract people that are unironic about that humor. Um, I think this might be called Godwin's law or whatever, but like, you know, like, so if you're in certain types of MRA MRA communities or MGTOW communities or Red Pill communities, like you make certain types of jokes, eventually you attract people that genuinely hate women. And then it becomes hard to tell the difference sometimes. Um, And I think that's kind of where I'm at with a lot of Red Pill communities. I don't think most Red Pill communities are full of people that hate women. I think that sometimes they just kind of like ironically cater to that audience. And then they unironically get some of those followers, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. But would you say that there's a significant portion of people in the red pill community who naturally just are trying to improve their like results with women in their life and they don't actually hate women? Like, would you agree with that? Uh, I mean, I would hope so. I, I don't, I don't spend enough time in the communities to like really know, but that would be the, the hope, right? That most people are just there for like self-improvement and stuff. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, let's, let's, let's move on to this. So there was one debate I was watching. It was, I think it was with a red pill guy. Uh, I'm sure it'll come to mind as we kind of get more into it. But basically, he was – you guys were going back and forth on uh, – he wanted you to admit that you play the game well because he was saying that – Oh, you, fucking you, Zerka. Yeah, yeah. I think it was that. He was saying that you're quite successful and uh, he wanted you to acknowledge it. And you kind of like – we're going a little bit in circles all that. So I guess my question is why, why not accept it? <clears throat> this is like really hard to explain, but like if hmm. – if I go out on a date with somebody, if I tr if I understand that person as a human being, and I understand like the things that that person wants, I'll conduct myself in a manner where I know I'm like checking all the right boxes. Oh. But the behavior is like relatively natural because I understand what they want, and I'm just trying to like treat them like I think like this is a human being that wants like to have a good time. Um, I think that sometimes when people look at interactions like that, I think they try to gamify the experience too much such that like you you know it's like okay like check the box i have to arrive you know five minutes late um i make sure that i zip my pocket so that i don't accidentally take out my cell phone um uh, i need to give her one compliment after the server comes here but it can't be too specific um i need to do like this and that and like i feel like it becomes like this weird checkbox thing in their head instead of like i'm gonna engage with you as a person i know that you like it when i ask you questions about yourself i know you like it when i joke about things that you've already told me because it shows that i'm listening i know that you like eye contact because it means that i'm a fucking human being that's not autistically looking around the restaurant like these are like just basic like people skills so I, yeah i guess I, I don't like it when it's described as playing a game because i think that the, the gamification of that experience kind of like it, it'll make you so robotic that you won't actually be performing as well as you should be if you treat it that way if that makes mm. sense but don't you think there could be a nice middle ground where like you are playing game, but you don't get super OCD about it. Like the stuff that you're you're basically describing is like keep strong eye contact, you know, mm -hmm. like all that stuff. That is, you know, good rules for playing the quote unquote game, and we don't have to call it that. Uh, but for the sake of this debate, let's just call it a game, right? Mm -hmm. Like those are all you know rules. Like the, the example you gave, like well, you know, uh, I try to pick up on her personality and like you know uh, act accordingly, but that relies on the assumption that you have the skill to one uh, properly. I guess, pick up on the cues that she gives you and to properly interpret them. So for example, uh, a guy who's not experienced, a girl might be like, oh, I'm so not having sex with you tonight. And anyone who knows women knows that means we're probably going to fuck, right? But a guy who doesn't understand you know, what that means might be like, oh, okay, she said no sex. Okay, see you later. Have a good night, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, I think the big disconnect here is that if you're, and I know you don't like the word natural, but if you're a guy who has a decent amount of social skills naturally, then yeah, like, just going into it with just being yourself is a good strategy because you already understand this stuff. However, I think it's important to consider that if you're a guy who has close to no idea of how women operate and just social skills in general, then just going in there and just like playing it chill and being yourself is going to backfire because yourself is a guy. Yeah, that's true. Women. That is true. And actually, I get really irritated when people say shit like that, like, oh, just be yourself and you'll be fine. It's like, well, you don't know who the fuck you're talking to. Maybe this guy is, you know, himself is actually the worst fucking possible thing to be well, on a date with somebody. That it is true to some extent. I guess it's just like, um, I, I feel like at the end of the day, the things that we're talking about, when I say we, I mean you and me, might yeah. actually reduce to the same things. Um, I just, I don't like that the phrasing of everything is a game because I feel like it puts people in weird mindsets sometimes. So here's something that I'll notice. Um, and this might just be me, uh, maybe it's just me. And maybe there might be some girls that are like this, but I don't actually know. If I can tell that somebody's playing a game, I get really irritated. And sometimes I'll just stop talking to people. The most common one that I see is I can tell that there are some girls that will like arbitrarily restrict when they'll send messages or how quickly they'll reply because they don't want to come off as like overly whatever. And like, if I'm sending you a message and I know that I've always got 12 hours to wait for reply, I feel like you're playing a game and I just instantly lose. It's like, fuck you. I don't care about this anymore. Um, I don't know if girls are the same way or if they can tell sometimes when like guys are playing certain games. Um, so, I mean, like there's probably like some line to walk where you're acting in an intelligent way um, and you're doing the things that you need to do, but just like, don't get lost in the sauce. Like, remember, like at the end of the day, we're humans having human interactions with other humans. And we just kind of like have to be aware of some social rules that dictate how we engage with each other. But it doesn't have to be this like, you know, 47 step guide to making sure you're getting laid by at least the second date or something, you know?
Yeah, I think the crux of the quote unquote issue here is you kind of have a negative, I guess, connotation of game. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand your definition. You're thinking of it as like an overly technical, like, oh my God, like I like this girl, but I can't text her for 12 hours type of thing. But if you look at it more of like the way I look at it is more like a holistic type of thing where like, you know, you and the girl, you're, you have this like little fun back and forth. You're both playing a game, but the game, it, it, the game could be to just get only things that you want and fuck mm -hmm. over the other person. So for an example of this would be a sugar baby, right? The game she's playing is how can I extract as much resources from the guy as possible? So that would be, I guess, a negative version of a game. But the game also could be, hey, you know, how do we have the most fun in this interaction? How do we, you know, make this interesting? How do we have like this fun verbal sparring back and forth that ultimately ends in both of us winning? So I guess the point I'm making is I don't think game has to be negative. There, are, you know, there's good games in life and there's bad games in life, right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you might play a fun game with your friends, but sometimes, you know, like if your friend could be playing a weird game with you where he's trying to like put you down, right? So games mm -hmm. can go both ways. So I just don't see why it has to be a negative thing. It can also be a positive thing. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Now, I mean, I'll say that cautiously because usually when I hear things described from the perspective of being a game, it ends up sounding like really manipulative and kind of gross. Mm -hmm. um, that's my inner love side coming out. But I mean, like theoretically, like it doesn't have to be negative. I mean, like you said, every interaction between two people is like this constant playing back and forth. Of, like, yeah. How much do you like me? How much do I show? How much I like you? Like, what's the appropriate like level of engagement? Like, because if two people meet each other, even if they're both up here, there's going to be like a back and forth where they edge up because nobody's going to be like, I really fucking like you. Like, let's move in. Or like, I want to fuck right now. Right. There's yeah. there's going to be like a natural, you know, kind of like back and forth, a natural touch. So yeah, I mean, like games don't necessarily have to be bad. But typically when I hear people describe things in the context of games, it ends up sounding like, a, like you got to win and beat the other person and your goal is yeah. to like get what you want out of them or whatever. So yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a game could be where, you know, it doesn't have to be zero sum game. It could be a game where you both win, right? I sure. think that's, that's the big mm -hmm. distinction. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that uh, if we're talking about social skills, that some guys who, you know, don't have those natural social skills, they need that kind of in-depth technical analysis of maybe watching other people interact so they can actually, their brain can process it. Like, would you agree that for some guys who don't have those social skills, having a more technical, you know, explanation of game is necessary for them to learn? I actually would feel like it wouldn't help that much. So this is something where I don't know if you've had real life experience with this because I just don't know. So I could be totally wrong, yeah. but I feel like um, when I think that you could work game like in a text message or like on Discord or something. But when you're in real life, like this is why like I don't like online interactions or whatever. You don't really know someone until you've seen them in real life because a real life interaction, there is so much more going on. You've opened like 30 different lines of communication uh -huh. just by being physically next to somebody. Um, I don't know if somebody could have to, if they don't know how to interact with somebody, I don't know if you could read some tips and then like convincingly pull it off in real life. I don't know if you'd end up in some, um, what's the name for like when robots appear almost human-like? There's like a, um, oh my God, there, there's a name for like, they're, 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 it's like it's like there are things that are clearly robots. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's like things that are robots, things that are people, and then things that are almost people. And they're like the creepiest because it's like, wait, what's going on? So I kind of wonder sometimes if you're a really socially awkward person, but you've read enough tips on like, okay, I know these are the things that I need to do, but you don't really have the rest of like the physical interaction understood or down. I, I wonder sometimes if you'd come off as like Nick Lovin or something uh, mm -hmm. from, yeah, you yeah. know, from Red. if you're just gonna keep being awkward, but I don't know, maybe maybe those tips yeah. can help with people. I'm not so sure. I have maybe. a pretty good answer on that. So mm -hmm. um, and it's a fair point. Uh, mm -hmm. So first comes conscious competence. So yes, you're right. If you're like on a date with a girl and you're like, have to logically think, okay, wait, should I hold eye contact or should I go? Like, yeah, it's gonna come <laughs> like super staring awkward. at them like this, yeah. Yeah, I 100% agree with you on that. That's why in that like video with Abram Preach that you were doing a, um, a reaction to the dating coaches, you, were, you made the point that like, you can't give someone like solid dating advice through a mouthpiece because of the time delay. And I agree with you on that. However, I think an important point to realize is first you have to get conscious competence before you get subconscious competence. And so at first it is gonna be awkward when you're learning a new skill. It's, mm -hmm. it's gonna seem a little forced, you're gonna forget. But once you practice something consciously enough, it becomes subconscious competence, where then you internalize the tip and then you can do it without coming off as like super staged or forced. So for example, when I was learning sales, Right, you know, uh, I was pretty new to the world of sales. I had a really good sales manager. She was explaining like some sales concepts to me. And the first time, you know, for your first bunch of times, I tried them on a customer. It was like a little weird. Like they were like, I, I gave off a weird salesman vibe, which turned off the customer. But then when I did it a bunch of times, it just I internalized it and became subconscious. So I think you have to start with that awkward conscious to get that conscious competence, and then you can move on to subconscious. 
Sure, for sure. The key part here would be um, deliberately practicing a new skill while being receptive to how it's received, which I would agree. If you're trying a new skill, even if it's awkward a couple times, um, like eventually, as long as you're learning from the experience and you're like deliberately trying to learn from the experiences, you should improve on it, right? Humans, we're social creatures. You, everybody can learn how to talk to another person. It's not outside of the bounds of what we should be able to naturally do. That's I recommend. It sounds really corny, but like I always recommend people, like if you're like a really anxious person, um, people socially are actually like really, at least in the United States, are usually pretty nice. People might be surprised at that. But if you're ever, it, it might sound silly, but like if you're in line at like the DMV or like a grocery store, like if somebody has like a, you know, like a nice fucking like hair or some stupid shit, like you can give people like a random compliment sometimes, just like move on. And like, even though you'll have like 12 million fucking degrees of anxiety doing shit like that, like you can get over those situations and like have like short little random conversations in line and be like, oh, cool. And then move on and you're good or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, dogs are really good ways of this. Kids are sometimes you do that. Like, oh, like blah, blah, blah. if you're not creepy, don't be like, oh, well, <laughs> I like your nine year old kid. daughter. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a nice um, looking little boy you got there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like there's a lot of little interactions like that you can have socially and you really only need like three or four positive experiences to build a fuck ton of confidence because um, right. you'll realize really quickly that in our heads we have this really weird model of other humans as being like very evil sometimes like oh god if i say anything this person's gonna hate me but like it takes a lot to make a person you know like publicly shit on you or something you know? yeah yeah uh well i think that one important thing to acknowledge is the learning process and curve can be radically different for different people so someone who like has pretty decent social skills and social awareness they can practice it once twice three times and mm -hmm. they'll internalize it really fast Someone like you, for example, versus someone who's like, I'm not talking about like full on like diagnosed autistic, but just like low key socially autistic who just doesn't get the stuff like they may require like 20 times more practice before they can internalize it. So I, I do think that like the process for learning it is going to be different for people. And for mm -hmm. some people, they might have to go through that awkward stage for a while, like it Possibly, might be a while yeah. before they mm -hmm. internalize it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I don't think we're necessarily disagreeing on much. So uh, we can move on to the next point. Mm -hmm. um, let me start off by this. What is your position on feminism? Um, I mean, like, it's kind of a pointless question. I would consider myself a feminist. Um, but I mean, like, that, that can mean so many different things, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess, what does it mean for you? Um, I mean, like, I think, like, women should be able to go to school. I think that women um, should enjoy more, like, sexual freedom in society. So things like access to contraceptives and abortion are important for, like, family planning. Um, I think women should be able to vote. Uh, yeah, I mean, crazy like, bro, basic stuff. Yeah, like, Radical. I mean, really, yeah, when we say we're a feminist, like, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, it just depends right. on, yeah. You know. I mean, I don't, I obviously agree with all of that. I also think women should be able to vote and have sexual freedom and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess this is kind of my position. You can tell me if you agree, or disagree. I think feminism, when you know, first started, first, second wave feminism, I completely agree with that. Like, yeah, women should have equal rights, uh, you know, women should have access to contraception. Uh, yeah, that, I think 99% of men would would be okay. Would agree with that. They're like, uh, very few guys are saying, no, let's take voting away from women. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is like third wave feminism. It became once women got equal rights, it became less about equality. It became more about power and control and silencing people who disagree with you and shaming men. So it, it, I think it started off really good, but then the movement kind of devolved into a really weird thing. And I'm not saying all feminists believe that. Usually the problem you have with a lot of movements is the loudest people on the, I guess, on the extremes are the loudest, right? And there's a lot of silent people in the center. You have that with politics too. Or like but, with the red pill communities too, right? This is kind of yeah, the same thing sure. that happens. Yeah, for sure. 100% man. But so I think that it's, this is why I don't call myself a feminist because I do agree. Yeah, I think women should have equal rights. Like we're not disagreeing on any issue. But I think the movement has become really corrupted. I guess I'm curious to hear your take on that. Um, I mean, like, uh, the short answer is we're probably going to agree. Um, I mean, we could get into the weeds, but, like, I would say that, like, most people in society probably have a decent view of this. I would say that, like, academically and, like, in the more activist circles, I think some really silly kind of toxic stuff gets pushed. Um, like, I think there is some value at looking um, through society through, like, a patriarchal lens. I think we can find some value there. But when people start getting into this, like, every single institution is corrupted by man and men are destroying right. everything in women's life. Like, okay, well, this is kind of silly now. Um, so, I like, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, like, I, we could probably talk for a while this, but I think we probably w would largely agree on most of this, I think. It's, it seems like it. Let me ask you this question. Do you think men mm -hmm. often become feminists for the wrong reasons? <laughs> Depends on what you consider the wrong reason. Well, I think a lot of people do it. They want to fuck girls. There's a lot of girls in those circles. A lot of right, but so that, that's feminist. the wrong reason. So, right reason is because you truly believe in equality and you feel like you're passionate about the cause. A wrong reason is because you're trying to use it as a way to get laid, which is largely not going to be effective. Um, 
I mean, like the true black pill is most social positions people have because they fucking want social credit for it. Um, I, okay. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if people know why they have any of the positions they have. I, I have a lot of negative uh, interactions with people of all communities, honestly. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I'll just, yeah, I'll say that. Fuck it. Fuck it. But can you see how a lot of men could become feminists for the wrong reasons? Like they just think like, and not even consciously, I think more subconsciously, they're like, oh, you know, if I just pretend to be her ally, she will, you know, bang me. I don't think they're consciously sitting there discussing that with their friends. I think it happens on a subconscious level because that's kind of what I've seen is like, like the men I've seen, I'm not saying you're in this category. I don't think you are, but just a lot of the other men I've mm -hmm. seen who call themselves feminists. I see them kind of like doing it for like, again, because they're, they're trying to use it as a way to get in with their girls. Sure. It almost feels a little bit like they're sucking up basically. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That, that, like I get that feeling sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then I think we don't really um, disagree on anything. Okay. Let's, let me move on to the next thing. Uh, do you think modern women in the West have become worse and less attractive in terms of values? Um, I would say no, but I mean, that's a real, that's going to be subjective to what we value, right? Okay. So what's, what, what can you explain what you value and why do you feel like they, it's remained the same? Um, so for me, I value, uh, I really value independence. Uh, I value like strong personalities, strong characters. Mm -hmm. Um, I value, um, uh, did I wait, did I say intelligence was the first one or did I say independence? Um, I think you said independence. Okay. Intelligence. So like getting like college educated, being able to have a job okay. and stuff like earning, like these are things that I really value. And I think women have probably made great strides in those areas. Um, like the kind of like more traditional demure, quiet housewife person is very unattractive to me. I super don't care about that type of person, which was probably more common in the past. Not to say that one of these is better or worse than the other, just in terms of what I personally prefer, uh, as a, as a partner. We're actually somewhat similar in that regard. I also don't really want, like for me, if I'm seriously dating a girl, I want her to have a job or at least like a passion that she's passionate about. I don't really like dating chicks who just like don't do anything and just want to like expect me to go out and earn money and they just sit at home. Like I'm not, I'm yeah. not going to do that. Are you, also, you live down here in Miami, right? No, I know. I'm living in the wrong place. Well, I, also, I, I was going to say, I've only been here for four months. Are there literally girls that just like no guys to like live on yachts? <laughs> Is that, it seems like there are people that just do that. Is that a real thing? That chicks do what? There's like girl. I see like different girls. Like because my wife is on here, she's one of the girls. It feels like there are girls who's like their life aspiration is to just they're pretty enough to meet the right guys to just like live on like other people's boats and shit, and that's all they do. Is that like a thing down here? Am I making this there? Up? There are yeah. They're, like they're not the majority, but there's okay. definitely a decent portion of chicks in Miami who basically yeah they they're the sum of their ambitions is banging a rich dude and getting Being on somebody else's boat. boat. That's, okay. like, that's like the extent of their ambition in life. Like yeah, yeah, that's, okay, that's gotcha, the main yeah. goal. Like, you know, that's how ambitious they are. And yeah, I agree with you. To me, that's very unattractive as well. Okay, uh, okay, fine. You made some fair points about those things. And yeah, I agree they have become better. What mm -hmm. about things like, um, let me think of something that you and I could both value that I think has gotten worse. Um, I think, hmm, I'm trying to think of a good one that where where things have gone worse. I think uh, in terms of, uh, I think I think loyalty has gotten a little worse. Uh, I think that, I, th I think women nowadays on average, and again, there's always exceptions to this, are more likely to not be as loyal when they commit. So they, like commitment has become less of a serious thing. And look, if you're just in a casual relationship, then it doesn't matter, right? But if you're in like a serious relationship, you're getting married, like, look, like divorce has become way more rampant than it ever used to be, right? And there's reasons for that. So I, I do think loyalty uh, and commitment is definitely on the, on the, you know, on the down. Like, would you agree with that or disagree with that? Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe, but uh, that, I, this will be a thing that I don't care about. Like I always do open relationships. I don't care about monogamy at all, so. That's that's going to be a thing that I, I I guess I agree, like more people probably cheat with like sexual freedom and all that comes people, you know, messing around and screwing around more. That's probably true. Um, that's just not a particular thing that I care about. But you OK, I understand we, you and I have that in common, too. We're both in open relationships. But um, but I'm assuming you don't want your girl to like I'm assuming I'm assuming within your open relationship, you have certain rules, certain things that are acceptable and certain things that are not acceptable. And like, let's say your girl is to go out and bang one of your friends. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sure that would be unacceptable. So I, I get that. But even if you're not being monogamous, loyalty is still an important factor, you know? Um, I I'm I understand what you're saying. This is just the worst area to hit on for me. I'm kind of unique. I super don't care about really? any of that shit. My girlfriend can go fuck my dad. I don't I just super don't give a fuck. Um, 
But there are other ways that I measure loyalty, like things that are important to me that aren't necessarily sexually related. Like if she um, trash talked you on the internet, right? Yeah, like stuff like that. That would be like a thing. Right. Um, or I guess like even in an open relationship, right? Like if you find out that like your partner is fucking somebody else and they're like at the same time, she's like, oh yeah, like this is way better. My partner's like a little dick. He's a piece of shit or like some shit like that. And I'd be like, okay, wait, what the fuck? That's a little bit fucked up. Um, but yeah, so that would be a bad thing, I guess. But in terms of um, are, are people, it's hard to talk about it through the, like, the lens of like open relationships because I don't know how common these are. And to be honest, most people that are in open relationships or whatever are fucking weird. So like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I compare my shit to their people, to other stuff anyway. Yeah, I mean, I actually agree with you on that. Uh, yeah, I do think that. When somebody tells me they're like, it's so hypocritical because I am. But when somebody tells me some shit like they're open or poly, I just assume they're fucking crazy. Uh, and that's true like 9.5 out of 10 times. So Yeah, I but, mean, yeah. I do think our open relationship is structured quite differently and we can kind of get into that later. Mm -hmm. Um, but okay, here, here's another one. Uh, I think that women's, I guess women's ambitions and stuff has mm -hmm. actually gotten worse. Meaning 20 years ago, I think that more women were trying, you know, I want to be a professor. I want to be a teacher. I want to mm -hmm. be an astronaut. Like I want to do things with my life. And now I see like with only fans, a lot of chicks, like they just want cloud on Instagram. That's like the sum of their ambitions. So I do think that like only fans and Instagram in some ways has taken women back in a way like for me for example dude i have like you know if chicks wants to do only fans make money off that no judgment like if, if she just wants cares about clout okay that's cool but i don't really think i want to be in a serious relationship with a girl who only cares about clout right i want a girl who's actually doing shit with her life so i think in that that's another way in which like you know women have actually taken a step backwards and what i like about like going to i guess places like colombia and europe is women they're actually like pursuing a career like they're actually doing shit with their life it doesn't involve like clout or tags or you know all that shit i mean i kind of agree with what you're saying but i think that there is like uh i think we're i think there's like a hidden thing here that's happening that even i'm gonna say i'm guilty of not saying all the time mm. i think that when it comes to women being obsessed with like tiktok and and social media and like only fans and shit i think that we're hardcore having a bias towards only looking at very conventionally attractive women i don't think the average woman has access to those platforms in like even though we all joke about it like i know a lot of like like decently attractive women like yeah you're pretty hot like most guys are like yeah i would fuck you 100 but they're not like one of those like super hot internet girls and they'll try to do like only fans and stuff and they don't really make that much money off it like maybe a couple hundred bucks a month just because they don't have like huge social media platforms to like promote it or anything they're not like an influencer on some other platform Wait, so i think really? that yeah um it sounds surprising but like i think that we have to be really careful when we think about like people online um, I can actually give the perfect, like also counter example of this too. When we think of people online, um, people, people tend to think of like only the most like attractive, prettiest and successful people. And it's very true of women. Like everybody misses all of like the, like average looking women. You just don't think about them. Cause if you look at the stats, like more women today are getting college degrees than they ever have before, but we don't really see that as much as like a new only fans account or fans, they account or whatever. Um, the, the counter example of this is something that I used to hear all the fucking time, um, is so many people would always say on Twitch, like, Oh, well, like if you want to be a big streamer, all you have to do is be a white guy that shouts all day. Just be some white nasally dude that screams all day on Twitch. and You'll get tons of viewers. Like, bro, that's, you're describing like fucking half the young boys in America are like white nasally dudes. Like it's criminal. Like, they're not popular. You're not seeing any of these people get success. Like you're just like hardcore selecting for a few people that happen to be incredibly visible. I, think. I mean, I think that's a fair point. There's definitely a sample bias that's going on. I do mm -hmm. personally know a whole bunch of average girls who are like making bank, fucking showing their feet on OnlyFans or mm -hmm. cooking naked or whatever. So they've got to uh, have like other social media platforms first, though, right? They've got to be big on like Instagram or Twitter or so they grew somewhere because starting only on OnlyFans or fans or whatever with no other presence, it's pretty because a lot of these places, they don't have organic discovery mechanisms. Like if you're on OnlyFans, it's not like they're going to link you to other unless you collab with another girl, right? You're not going to get linked off to some shit. No, but Instagram does. So a lot of the OnlyFans girls, they use Instagram mm -hmm. as a main tool of marketing. So like, you know, they post like a sexy photo. It doesn't even have to be that sexy. Just anything that shows that you are, have a vagina and a whole bunch of guys will, ooh, like the post, follow. Uh, like, I think it's pretty easy for the average girl, uh, if she's even tiny bit creative, to build a following. Versus I think for guys, you really need a skill. Like, you got to be like, offer some kind of value to your audience. Versus for a lot of chicks, looks is sufficient. Um, I, I, I will agree that women can get away with doing stuff that's more appearance related and not as like skill oriented. Um, I just don't think, I don't think the average woman could, but I, I there's no real way to resolve that. Like if yeah. we go into a college classroom with a hundred women and we send them out to like make money on OnlyFans, I think that only like one or two or three or four maybe will have like any success there. And most just won't do that well, even if they're like, okay, attractive, I think, but 
in some ways there's almost like an advantage to uh average girls so i don't know if you like watch porn or you don't but like uh like if you're skimming i'm not saying i watch a lot of porn but like you know if you're on a porn site and mm-hmm. the ad pops up on Pornhub. Uh, and it's like, you know, hook up with hot moms in your area. They deliberately show you chicks that are not that hot because if you see a girl who's super hot, your brain just discounts it like you have no chance. So a lot of times they deliberately pick average looking girls or grandmas and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And th- there's like some interesting psychology behind it because if you show the average guy who's fucking jerking off the poor and a really hot chick in his area looking to meet up, he's going to discount it as like, oh, I don't have a chance with her. But if you show him like a 45 year old, mom who's had a few kids he thinks he has more of a shot and he's more likely to click on that so i think not to get into the weeds of it but i think in Mm -hmm. some ways uh being average can give you a certain advantage because more guys think they have a chance with you like there's a interesting point that um i've heard you know other people make is that like attractive girls get approached a lot but Mm -hmm. super duper attractive girls like tens actually get approached less than sevens and eights because a lot of guys just see them and immediately discount them thinking i have no shot with her she's too pretty um, yeah, it's possible. But let, let me move on to the next thing. Here's another one that I thought of as we were talking. One thing that's gotten a lot worse is flaking. Um, I can tell you, I you know, I got, I don't know, like I graduated from college in 2012, 2013. I downloaded Tinder. I was going around LA picking up girls. And I can tell you in the last 10 years, it's become a lot worse. Like it went from, you know, like in 2013, 2014, maybe 50% of girls would flake on you. So you set up four dates, two girls show up, one of the girls reschedules, one of the girls disappears. Now it's something like 90%, 95%. So if you want to get a one date, you have to set up dates with 10 girls. Like it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And that's another reason I like going to Eastern Europe or Colombia, way less flaky. Like you make plans with a girl, she shows up vast majority of the time, unless she has like a legit emergency that of course happens, but like, you know, girl randomly flaking and disappearing on you with no reason that doesn't happen often in Eastern Europe, but it happens all the time in the U S and from my experience, it's just been getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. I mean that I, I, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, I guess I've only used like Tinder like sporadically throughout my life, but I've always been like in a dramatically different geography. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I I don't know what your approach is for um for the Tinder stuff. It's hard to say, but like typically if I'm if I'm talking to somebody with on, on Tinder, um, I feel like I have to set up a real life meeting like relatively quickly or else it's not gonna happen. So like sure. probably like by like maybe like a day or two of, of chatting, but like if I'm talking with someone on Tinder for like a week, I don't think I'm ever gonna see this person. But like yeah, you like chat for a day or two, try to set something up, um, and then you yeah, drive somewhere, meet somebody. I'm trying to think of like how how long have you been on Tinder for? When did you first download it? Fuck, I don't, I don't, re- I don't remember. Like ballpark, was, ballpark. Like twenty fourteen, maybe twenty thirteen. Oh, well, that's, that's basically the same time as me. Okay. Yeah. And you're, and you're, but you're good. Hmm? back then, I was in like I lived in Nebraska, so that was it was a whole other ball game. Okay, fair um, enough. That's a confounding factor. Yeah, and I used it for like a year or two, and then I got off of it because I was dating somebody, and then like between relationships, I kind of hop on it. And but you haven't noticed that's gotten worse throughout the years. Um, I haven't used Tinder recently. That. So I think it's probably been a few years since I've tried to meet anybody on Tinder. Mm. Um, like, how do you normally meet girls? Now, well, now usually so people will DM me on Instagram and shit. <laughs> yeah, <I> really <laughs> well, that's the like advantage that. of being verified. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, verified is the advantage of being a big streamer YouTuber, right? So like, right. I, it's not like I have to try super hard to find people to message me these days. Right. Um, but like if I'm traveling somewhere, um, if I want to like talk to somebody that I don't know, like I don't want them to know me because it's kind of weird sometimes. Um, I might hop on Tinder, but I haven't. I just haven't done that in a while, so it's hard to say. Um, but I feel like I've been able to set up like at the very least like dates before. Like we'll go out to eat or whatever. It might not lead to a hookup, but um, I just I don't have the sample size to be able to say if it's gotten like better or worse. Mm. I, I truly can't say it. Yeah. Okay. How about this? Do you have you traveled like recently to Eastern Europe or South America or any of those places? Southeast Asia. Um, um, yeah. Travel outside like, the US a lot. Yeah, I've been to like Taiwan, South Korea. Um, a bunch of places in in Europe. I lived in Poland for three months. Um, okay, yeah. Pol- yeah, Poland is a good place. I've been to Poland too. Mm-hmm. Do you notice like a huge difference in the kind of experience you have with dating women in in Poland and in America? Meaning, I'll, I'll explain to you what it is for me, and you can tell me if that's been similar for you. It, when I'm in Poland, uh, I don't have to set up four or five dates in order to get one girl to show up. I make plans with a girl. She's going to show up, and she's probably going to show up on top. She's not going to be two hours late. Uh, she's not going to make random excuses. She's not going to ghost on me. She's probably not going to play weird power games. Uh, she's not going to ask me how many followers I have on Instagram. She's just she's going to be a normal human being. 
you know, versus in the U. Yeah, of course, these exist in the U.S., but especially living in Miami, a lot of times that's not the case. The girl will show up two hours late if she shows up and she will make weird excuses and she will play weird power games. Uh, so it's just like a radically different experience. Like I can totally I think- see how some guys living in the, in the West uh-huh. get super jaded and almost start hating women because, you know, like imagine. OK, like imagine uh, every Every, uh, let's just say, Chinese person you interact with is super duper rude to you. At some point, your brain is going to go, okay, maybe Chinese people kind of suck, right? And that could totally be a sample bias. You're just meeting the wrong people, right? But, you know, at some point, your brain is going to make that conclusion and you have to actively fight that. So I guess my question is, have, do you not see that like radical difference in the experience between Poland and the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a difference, but I think a lot of it boils down to like you're American. Um, and when you're American, you're traveling to some of these overseas countries, people think you're fucking rich. Like you get to be like the exotic guy. Like it's like if you're in the US and you've got like a really nice Cambridge accent or some shit, or you're like a from Melbourne, Australia or some shit, like people are like, oh my God, this guy's like cool. He's British. He's probably really wealthy. He's whatever. Um, but like when you're especially in like Southeast Asia, um, if you're in like South Korea or Taiwan or Hong Kong or some shit, if you're white down there, people will assume that like you're fucking loaded. Like this dude must be wealthy. He's traveling around the world. Like you've got a lot, you can, you can, um, I guess the same red pill terms, I guess like you can communicate a fuck ton of value very quickly just by virtue of the fact that you're some places that you're white. And then in other places like them knowing that you're American. It's pretty interesting that you bring that up because you know, actually who, uh, who says this argument a lot when I debate black pillars. So uh, usually when I talk about my overseas travel, they say they usually discount and say, well, you know, it's largely because you're American The girls think you have money, but I guess you can easily get around that by not ever leading with your wallet by, you know, not inviting her on expensive dates, but inviting her straight to your place or for a walk. Or for example, uh, you know, when I travel, uh, sometimes I just say I'm Russian. I don't even say I'm American. Like, right. I just, you can't, I mean, if the girl asks yeah, me, I mean, like they might not, you don't have like, to, she has no idea. Example, but they'll, they'll assume that you're, Oh, maybe they don't. I don't know how your profile looks or whatever. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. If, if you read my profile, you, if I'm in Poland, you wouldn't really think I'm American because again, like I say, like, you know, whisper Russian in your ear. Like, well, I, I mean, like Russian fluently. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know how to explain this, but like, I know, like, I could tell even when I was in London, like, you can, you can see what British people look like. And I'm sure that I, maybe I can't see because I'm fucking blind or whatever, but like, I'm pretty sure that if I were to go to European countries to show people pictures of me, people are like, you're fucking American. I can tell 100% you're American. Uh, maybe it's not that way with your profile. I mean, it could be different experiences, but it um, might just, be. But my, my understanding is that people just tend to assume, like, if you're American, you're traveling, like, you're, like, pretty wealthy. And America, for all the hate we get in our own country, is, like, it's a pretty cool place. Like, if you're from America, like, that's cool. You must be, like, doing pretty well if you're traveling the world and shit. So that would be, like, I would assume that would be, like, a huge advantage. But I think 10, tw- even 20 years ago, you would have been right about that. I do think in a lot of places, it depends on the country, really. It depends on the country. Because Philippines, yes, they're, like, super obsessed with Americans. So mm-hmm. I think in some places like Southeast Asia, especially Philippines, just by the virtue of you being American, you have a huge leg up. But like, let's take a place like Medellin, Colombia. Uh, you know, w- Americans actually have a pretty bad rep there because they're known for going down there for drugs and prostitutes, right? So actually, some uh, there's a saying in Medellin: the hottest, the most high value, whatever, high, hottest, high class girls, they actually don't date Americans, right? It's mm-hmm. actually considered a social downgrade for a top tier Colombian girl to date an American. Uh, Cause again, cause they have that reputation of going down there for, you know, sex, prostitutes, drugs, right? And in some ways, like when you're dating in Medi, and I'm not gonna say it's just, it's like an uphill battle. No, it's awesome there and it's easier. But in some ways being American, like the girls are more on guard, right? Cause they're just used to like horny fucking old British dudes and American dudes going down there just to fucking, you know, have sex with as many hookers as possible. So. I don't think and I don't think it's as strong. I guess my argument is I don't think it's nearly as strong as you. You know, I don't, I don't think it's just as simple as, oh, you're American. So you have a huge advantage there. Uh, I think there's a huge cultural aspect in like Eastern Europe and South America that is superior in some ways to, uh, you know, the culture in uh, America. Like, for example, I think a, a girl in Poland, if she tells her girlfriends like, yeah, you know, I had a date with this guy tonight, but. I fuck him. I just flaked on him. I decided to like, you know, stay home and surf TikTok. In Poland, her girlfriends would be like, oh, that's not really cool. Like you shouldn't schedule on people last minute. Versus in Miami that her girlfriends would be like, yeah, fuck him. He probably has small dick anyway. Maybe. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's not like a really big generalization. Um, but we have to kind of speak in generalizations, you know. No, yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm trying to. 
I'm trying to draw from my because I've been a year. Yeah, just I've like think back to your Poland experiences and see if there's anything you observed where you're like. Well, in Poland, I was there for I was a fucking pro gamer just living in a fucking gaming house all day. So I don't know how many. Mm. Because like for me, there's a radical difference when I'm in Poland and when I'm dating in America. It's like a radical difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I can speak to those generalities. I don't think I'd be able to. I like. I know that like my uh, my wife has some girlfriends that are like friends that are girls in uh, Sweden. And I don't know, her friend group sounds like pretty similar to like any like it and uh, any American friend group, girly group I can think of. Like they, some of them are like crazy with guys. Like there's like a lot of the same tropes. Like um, some, like I know there's one girl in the group that gets obsessed with guys really easily. Um, mm -hmm. There's another girl that like, she's the girl that as soon as she starts dating a guy, she disappears for six months because some people do that in relationships. Right. Like, uh, but in terms of like flaking and stuff, I, I don't think I have the experience. I don't think I can really say, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't okay. I wouldn't be able to say. Yeah. Fair enough. Let, let me let me say this. So another thing besides flaking that I think is radically different is the oh, attitude. Wait. Hmm? Go ahead. Uh, something I will say though yeah. is um I also don't see the flaky thing as much in the United States. Uh, but again, my dating pool is gonna look a lot different if I'm like in industry or if I'm like people right. that are DMing me from Instagram. Sure. But um I'm willing to bet there are like there are certain types of communities that exist today. Um especially like I don't, I'm not trying to attack like people that live in LA or Miami, but like, I don't know what the fuck, like the people, I don't know what the fuck people do here in Miami. Okay. Do you ever go to like South beach or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's like these, all these people go here and they're all like hippies and they all party all the time here. Okay. None of these motherfuckers have jobs. None of them work. I don't know where the fuck they get their money from. I have no idea. Like what the existence <laughs> day to day exists like of half these fucking people. Like someone's like, I thought oh, about that. Yeah, I have no fucking idea. It blows it's, it's, my mind. It's it's a lot worse in uh, Venice, California, in like uh, LA. Oh, I used to live in um, I used to live in a uh, Culver City. Um, so okay. I've been to Venice yeah, Beach yeah. and stuff. Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, Venice Beach is mind boggling because none of those people have jobs, and mm -hmm. those condos are like ten thousand a month. Yeah, it's insane. I, so I don't know what the fuck any of these people do down here. I saw someone in your chat said sugar daddies, but it's true of a lot of the guys as well. So I don't know if it's all just like everybody's got like rich parents or whatever. Um, or like, so um, I'm sorry, but the reason why I bring that up is that like, if these people don't have that structure in their life, if like their moms and dads are still like paying their bills and they like haven't even like really gotten to work yet or anything, it wouldn't surprise me if these people are like a bit more flaky or, you know, don't hold the commitments. Cause like they're still largely like, even in their mid twenties, even sometimes early thirties, they're still kind of kids. You know, they haven't really had that like, ability to set a schedule and do shit yet. A lot of these people might wake up at like, you know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock, one o'clock. They don't really do whatever, you know, they party every night. It's whatever, you know? Mm, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to completely discount that. I do think there might be a maturity aspect to it, mm -hmm. uh, but I have encountered the flaking with like, you know, career woman, older MILFs, like, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with my website, but I do like love reports or whatever. So I share like my interactions. I mean, I had one where it took me six months to meet up with this MILF. She's like 49 and she like flicked on me like at least a hundred times, uh, you know. Uh, so I, it happens with older women as well. Women who have like legit careers, legit jobs. I, I think there's two reasons for it, mainly two reasons. I think the first reason is simply a uh, the marketplace really sucks. So meaning like there's no opportunity cost. So, for example, a girl, uh, your Tinder date can flake on you and five other dudes. There's still going to be 100 dudes who are down to meet up with her because the marketplace is so skewed in her favor. Like we did an experiment on my channel. We created a profile as like a grossly obese girl. She was like a one by any standard. And she had 500 matches in 24 hours. And some of those guys were like begging her to hang out. Oh, my God, you're so gorgeous. We have to meet up. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like this chick is by all standards not attractive. You know, so it's just like that, I guess, just to show you how skewed the marketplace is. So I think that's the first factor. There's no opportunity cost. I think the second factor is cultural. Uh, I do think that American culture is a lot more in the West in general is much more forgiving of flakiness, inconsistency, bullshit, playing games versus like in Europe. That's not really tolerated. Like, meaning, like, it's not like you get kicked out or ostracized for it, but, like, if she tells her girlfriends, like, yeah, fuck this guy, I just, you know, I, I'm going to make him wait for three days, her girlfriends are not going to be like, oh, that's awesome. They're going to be like, oh, that's not really cool, you know? So I think there, there is definitely a cultural difference there. It's possible. Man, um, I feel like it's a pretty important part of your philosophy, so I understand why you want to – <laughs> Wait, why it's a big deal to you. I just – I don't have that experience. No, it's fine. It's I would fine. be really curious to see interactions, like – I can't imagine somebody flaking on me a hundred times. If somebody flakes on me, like my, my, this is going to sound like a game, but two to three messages is the limit. If I send you two or three messages, you haven't responded. I never talk again. Cause I feel like you're not interested. Like, okay, well, fuck it. I'm going to waste my time. Cause I don't want to like get myself, get mind fuck at that point. Um, I feel like if somebody's flaking that much, I would feel like they're either like 
secretly gay and they don't want somebody to find out or they're like married and they're trying to like get away from their husband or there's like some other weird shit going on. Um, yeah, that would be. I think it's important though. You do have to recognize that you are in a lot of ways an exception because you know, you are fairly popular on YouTube. You are verified sure. on Instagram. Uh, you know, I looked at your Instagram, like you have a pretty good Instagram, I think better than most people. Uh, you have like social proof on there. So in a lot of ways you are like the average guy is not going to have that kind of luxury like you, mm -hmm. for example. Right. Would you acknowledge that? Yeah, but I mean, you still shouldn't be going after a girl that many times. That's a lot of times. If you're, if you're, I think, I think that if you're an average guy, you, you have to play at your advantages, but you can't, I, I mean, yeah. I think I maybe mistold the story. I don't want to get your audience to get the wrong impression that I'm like chasing girls. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm in a very unique position that like I'm a content creator. So a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. I do for the video. Like experimentation. Yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not mm -hmm. like, like if I didn't have a YouTube channel, I would have given up like 98 flakes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of times I'm just like pushing the envelope and seeing what is possible. You know, can you take yeah. a chick who's like totally flaking on you and over time turn around and get a date? You know, have been successful doing that, you know, some of the time. Um, okay, here's here's another one. I think ways that I will just to, uh, kind of on that note. If you're a guy doing the app thing is really, really, really hard. Like you need to find like a really good friend, preferably one that's a girl to give you tips and shit on setting your profile. Like that's going to be like a grind if you're trying to do it. Because like you said, like the it, it is like very disproportionate the amount of um, men chasing women on those platforms mm -hmm. versus uh, women chasing men. So yeah, it is. You're going to be grinding hard on those for sure. Yeah, but the interesting thing, it didn't used to be like that. When Tinder first came out 2013, 2014, it was actually a lot easier. You just need to have a few decent photos of you. Like mm -hmm. I remember the profile I had in 2013, it was like like a few selfies, like one picture of me. It was like 20 levels worse than the profile I have now, but I was probably getting equal, if not more matches because it was just so much less competitive. Uh, so yeah, I but I mean like if you think about it like back then, I, I want to say when Tinder – I want to say when Tinder first came out, it didn't quite sound as hookup-y as it is now. Sure. And now it sounds like a little bit more like, like, well, now even more, right? Because there are multiple dating apps. Like if you want to find love, you use this or that or blah, blah, blah. But like, if you're on Tinder, you're just there to fuck, right? So like, if you think about Tinder as like the app that gives you sex, obviously there's going to be like a million fucking men that are getting sure. on Tinder for that because women don't need to, um, women don't need to go on their phones for sex, right? They've got like any guy that they're friends with in real life. <laughs> they can fuck if they want to. So, I mean, like there's going to be that, that disproportionate engagement with the platform because it's got sure. the reputation it does, which makes me wonder, I bet there are, I don't know this for a fact, but I bet that other dating platforms, if you're a little bit more serious are probably going to be better for men than Tinder. That'd be my guess. But. Slightly, but this issue exists on all the platforms, Bumble, Hinge, like those are less hookup -y apps. Uh, this issue is you know what's ironic actually an app called field mm -hmm. which is like a threesome bdsm app on average is a lot less flaky than like bumble or hinge uh that's an interesting little fun fact mm -hmm. uh so this issue exists across all apps it's not like one app is like super flaky and the other apps are great uh mm -hmm. but that's what was okay so the point i want to make is uh one thing that i think has gotten worse as well is attitude uh like I know that like when I go to like Poland, like generally speaking, of course there's shitty people in every place, but generally speaking, like the average girl I meet up with, she's positive, she has good intentions. Like she's not trying to like play some weird power game or get money. She's, she just wants to meet a cool guy and build a connection. And again, there's of course exceptions. There's shitty chicks in Poland, but we're talking about the average girl versus like in Miami, like, yes, there's great girls here. I have a great girlfriend, but the average chick, like two out of three times, She's going to have a shitty attitude. Like she goes into the day with like a massive attitude and she's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like, like that type of shit, which I think has gotten worse in the last 10 years. Yeah. But I mean, like, I, like I just can't, I just moved here from LA. Uh, I lived in LA for three years. And Where do you live now? Miami. I live in Miami now. Oh, um, you do? Okay, cool. Yeah. South of one of these fucking rivers where the bridge goes up every two fucking hours. Um, <laughs> we probably don't live far apart then. Yeah, maybe. Um, but the, um, I, I do girls in these cities are fucking horrible. <laughs> yeah, there we then go. again, so are the guys. So like, yeah, like dude, if you're trying to like date a girl, like a fucking LA girl or a fucking Miami girl, like you have to be like, you need to go into that with both eyes open, yes. realizing that you're about yeah. to play some crazy fucking games right. and the people suck. Um, right. But that, that's like it from my perspective, like, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I, I super don't like these kinds of people. Like, like sure. I go out to all the nice restaurants and shit and I, it just, I feel so out of place and everything feels so fake and disgusting to me. But I mean, like, that's just like kind of the, unfortunately the culture of a lot of like major American cities, it just is what it is. Sure. Um, 
Yeah. So I, I mean, like if, if you're coming at this, when you start to talk like this, now I can understand a little bit better. If you're talking about this from like a, these are like a Miami girl type of thing versus like an American girl type of thing. I, I 100% agree with everything you said before. Okay. Like that's what the people, that's what the people in the cities are like. Um, yeah. It's a whole bunch of like very hungry. And it also makes more sense now. I hear you bringing up like that Instagram verified shit. Um, it's like very cloud hungry people, very networking hungry people, very much like everybody in this fucking city, like has an agent and is waiting on their big deal and is about to go big. It's like just really crazy, cringy shit. Shit. but um yeah. that's definitely like an american major city phenomenon mm. with um yeah with people yeah yeah i mean uh, for sure like if you go to the midwest it's going to be radically different like in sure. ohio or uh virginia mm -hmm. than it is in miami or but, even people in places like chicago or fucking yeah. kansas city or whatever boston, be yeah. Or, chill, yeah. Yeah. or even like austin or dallas yeah yeah but if you go to like a major european city like warsaw or krakow or uh budapest the girls there are still great. The people there don't suck, like not nearly man. as much. So I don't think- Maybe, I don't know. I, like, maybe I just got a bad impression of some of the, I feel like you can go to like places like, you can go to like London or you can go to uh, Berlin and you can find some like crazy cringy people. London um, is quite different though. Lust London is in a lot of ways very similar to America. Like London sure. is an English city. Like the culture there is very similar. So uh, I'm talking about more like Warsaw, Budapest, mm -hmm. Prague, like Eastern Europe, major cities in Eastern Europe. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, I don't have the experience to say, but I, I haven't spent a lot of time in Eastern mm. Europe. So yeah, it's possible. Yeah. No, yeah, I guess like my, my final point on this is like, yes, I do agree with you that some of it is like a city thing, city versus country thing. Mm -hmm. But you can't just discount it as like, oh, major city people suck. Because in some major cities across the world, people are great. Like, you know, uh, uh, like we'll take Bogota, Colombia, uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, Warsaw, Krakow. Budapest. These are places where I've personally been. I can tell you the average person there is like pretty cool. Like, you know, there are some shitty people there, but they don't all suck. Uh, but it sound, doesn't sound like we're actually disagreeing on much there. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, let me move on to this. Do you think modern men have become weaker? Um, yeah, for sure. Okay. Then <laughs> we actually, I think that, um, I think that I, so there is this concept, uh, we'll say a feminist concept of toxic masculinity, which I agree with 100%. I think that the way that we were sold masculinity in like in, in all of my life in the 90s and early 2000s was just really shitty. Like the idea of like a strong man is somebody that like starts fights, like talks shit, like I guess is big, like uh, makes a lot of money, you know, like shit like that, um, which I think is like a really shallow interpretation of manliness or manhood. Uh, so, I mean, I think we were good and that we kind of like deconstructed that concept of masculinity. We call it toxic. We get rid of it. I think that's fine. But I think we like tossed everything from from masculinity, which I think is overly negative. Like, I think sure. there were aspects of it that were positive. Like, I think men in general should like represent some amount of financial stability, some amount of like success in life, like the ability to be like an emotional bedrock for a partner. Oh, uh, like, I, I think that there are some traditional concepts of masculinity that are good that we, oh. for some reason, like everybody toss them. Um, and I mean, there are reasons I'm why- like the, the baby out with the bathwater, basically. Yeah, kind of, yeah, it's, I'm saying that in like more words, basically, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. Can you give me some specifics? Like, I mean, you gave me a few, but what are what do you think are like like currently speaking? What would you? What are some examples of tox toxic masculinity for you? I, I think that like the 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 funniest one would be like men that value themselves based on how many women they can get to fuck them. Like this idea that like women are like there to be like churned and burned, but like ultimately your entire existence is based on a woman's validation of you because the most important thing to you is how many women are validating you enough to fuck you. I think is like kind of a weird way to to view your masculinity. Um, that would be one. Does toxic. anyone actually believe that outside of the pickup community? Absolutely. Really? Men, every 99% of men in the world, they might not admit it and they might not have introspected enough, but men live and die on women's opinions of them. This is why like, uh, like any woman that like compliments a guy is like a fucking thing that will stick with that guy for the rest of their entire fucking life. No, it's it's like churns you like that rejection hurts because yeah. like a woman's opinion of yourself is like to a lot of men, like one of the most important opinions that they can possibly have. And like getting rejected by a woman is the worst thing in the world. Being accepted by a woman is the best thing in the world. Um, right. I, I think that it's, I think it's incredibly foundationally important to a lot of men's uh, view, view of the world. But I would um, argue that's actually unmasculine behavior. Like it's more masculine to not care what other people think of you. Yeah, I think to some extent. Yeah, I don't know if I necessarily gender that, but um, yeah, I mean, like the the idea that like you should be able to exist like independently of other people's opinions of you, or not like be held captive at least by their opinions or expectations of you, I think is really important if you can do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, what, what are some other things that you would say are like, you know, included in toxic masculinity? Um, like just the, like the, like the urge to like, you know, fight or start shit over like words, um, that like the kind of like that violence spur, I think is like really stupid. I think you should be able to walk away from shit. Yeah. Um, it's kind of funny seeing like, yeah, I, I think that this is something that people have talked about for a long time that, that for some reason people, um, still have a hard time grasping. Like that seems to be pretty built into it. Um, the obsession with money is really bad. Um, I, I think that people end up throwing away so much of their lives chasing money and they end up being in their thirties, like millennials, like me. And like, this is like, there are so many, this is like the average, not average, but this is like a really popular millennial story is I went to grade school. They told me I needed to do well in high school so I could go to college. I went to college. I did well in college. I got a mm. sick job and I had a really strong career. It didn't build many relationships. Now I'm 30. I've already saved like $120,000. Um, I'm earning like quite a bit. I've got a house and I am lonely and fucking miserable. And I don't know what the fuck I'm doing with my life. I hate my job. I've got, I'm earning money. I have no friends. I have no relationships. I don't like video games anymore. What the fuck? And I think that that experience is really common and mm-hmm. people, it's not even just a man problem, but that, ex, that idea that like, well, Hey, get a job, earn money. And that's good. And it's like, I, there's way more to life than that. Mm. I, I agree with you on that. I mean, I think that a lot of those things that you just described, I never really associate with masculinity. Uh, I just more thought of those as like modern issues that people have. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, for example, let's take the starting stupid fights thing. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like I never just, and again, this could be, we just have different interpretations of masculinity or what toxic masculinity entails, but mm-hmm. I never associated that with like a masculine quality. Like to me, it's actually more feminine uh, because like you're overly sensitive to like perceived slights, like a real man, like doesn't give a shit if someone like says something, they just laugh it off. Right. And that's like, to me, that's like alpha, you know, being manly, like you don't care. Like you're just like, whatever. And if you're like, Oh my God, you said what? Like I need to fight you now. And mm-hmm. you're going to risk going to jail. That's, that's more of like a, caddy type of you know trait so i i think of that almost as the opposite of being masculine that's more feminine in my opinion uh getting into like these stupid like squabbles over nothing uh you know like that's kind of my take on that uh what was the other one you mentioned um the chasing money or uh, it was like the obsession with money the like the quick to violence thing um the super cut off from your emotions uh, i think is a really okay. negative trait I that think that sometimes, I will you. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think that people can go too far from it. Um, I don't like as much as I hate to say it. Like, I do think that women generally expect in relationships that their emotions are going to be like front and center, that they're going to have the main stage for that, um, which I think is okay. Um, but like men's total inability to connect with their emotions at all, it hurts their ability to connect with women, and it hurts mm-hmm. with their ability to connect with themselves. This is an interesting theory I've heard. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard that like one of the reasons why dating apps are so skewed is if you if you look at the if you look at the polling data, it's something like I think 24% of men are okay being on their own and not dating, and for women it's like 38%. It's like 50% higher. Mm. And one of the reasons posited for this is because women are a little bit more emotionally connected, their friendships with women are super emotionally fulfilling. Um, I don't know if I'm emotionally stunted, so maybe this is a bit of a self-report, but like, even with like casual women friends, I feel like I can emotionally connect with them way better than I can with other men. Um, so like even at an emotional level, like the friendships I have with women, I I really enjoy those. Like those are really important to me. It's a lot harder to connect with men in that way. And I've heard some people say that like, this is a reason why like a man outside of a relationship feels so fucking lonely. It's because he has no emotional connection in his life. Whereas single women can still like hang out with their girlfriends and have like pretty deep emotional connections with them. I don't know how true that is, but like anecdotally, it seems to hold up. Yeah. I will definitely grant you that point. Uh, that is the one thing that I do associate with like over masculinity is this idea that you have to be cut off from your emotions and just be stoic to an unreasonable degree. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I do think that's detrimental for guys. So yes, uh, I will definitely, like, like, let's take my dad, for example, right? Like he's like, you know, a strong alpha type of Russian guy, right? Like he, he was very successful financially from a young age, you know, dated a lot of women, uh, you know, was like successful, like blah, blah, blah. But like, you know, just the way he grew up, like he's very cut off from his emotions because that's what he thinks being, you know, masculine is. Right. Like he has a very hard time, like even saying like, I love you and stuff like that. Uh, so, yes, I will grant you that uh, that point. I do think that's an issue with uh, masculinity. And like you see like some of like the, you know, the manosphere guys, they say like, oh, you know, you know, never show emotion to a girl. She's going to get turned off. <laughs> and I'm like, that's pure nonsense. Like, yeah. you know, 
Like he's just, you don't want to be a little whiny bitch. Yeah, exactly. Like a nice middle ground between that and like not showing emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, I'll grant you that point. Uh, but the way I kind of see it is just from my perspective is most guys, you know, you can kind of think of it as like a spectrum. Like we have like the guys who are like over trying overly hard to be masculine. And maybe mm-hmm. those are the kind of guys like my dad who won't show emotions. Other than the spectrum, you have the guys who are like way too feminine. I think the problem with most guys, they tend to be on the overly feminine side uh, versus the overly masculine side. Would you agree with that? Um, it's probably going to super depend on like age class and um, like geography. Um, like if you're talking like college age men or whatever, yeah. like these days, I, I mean, I would probably agree with that. I mm-hmm. think, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. Just... I might, I actually being left leaning, I'd probably reword that. I wouldn't say that they're too feminine. I would just say that they're like too weak. Um, like they, yeah, they've lost some like resiliency and character or some like stability that I would expect. I'd say a man, but really a man or a woman to have, you yeah. know? Because a lot of the ways that people act today, even men, I would look down on women for acting that way. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Let, let's move on to the next thing. Do, do you mind mm-hmm. if I ask you about your relationship a little bit? Yeah, whatever you want. All right, cool. Uh, so, you are in a two-way open relationship, right? Yeah. Okay. I, the, we, we have a somewhat of a difference. I'm in a one-way open relationship. So, Wait, I what guess is that? Wait, what does that mean? Yeah. So, that basically means I hook up with other girls and she only hooks up with me. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, and I guess this might be less of a debate and I guess more of just like me being curious. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you don't have any like feelings of jealousy with like the idea of your girl hooking up with other guys? Um, no. So I want to stress this at the beginning because I, obviously I've got fans and people like want to copy my lifestyle and shit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the way that I process things is relatively unique. So I wouldn't expect people to try to do what I do. Um, but just for whatever reason, the lifestyle I've lived or who I am or whatever, um, I, I don't really, it's jealousy is not a thing that I process very much. Um, my thought process has always been like, you know, if, you know, if you find somebody better, you like more than fucking leave, like I'll find somebody else. Like I can do that. Like that's okay with me. Um, but I don't usually, it's not like I have like people breaking up with me all the time because they're, they think they find better partners. So it's just usually not something I'm worried about, I guess. Hmm. And then that's- I also like, I'm super <laughs> probably negative, but I'm very much like in my work. Um, like if I'm not paying attention, I can like bleed off like weeks of time into streaming, email, sponsor stuff, like working on videos, like all sorts of shit. I can just like spend so much time doing it. Um, and then like, I've got like a lot of people I can hook up with too. So it like, yeah, it just, it's not something that really bothers me that much. I don't care. What about feelings of possessiveness? Like for example, for me, like the idea of another dude banging my girl, like just makes me physically disgusted. Cause I just, you know, I don't want to say like women are property or anything like that. No, far from that. But there's a feeling of possessiveness, you know, like she's mine. Like, you know, just the idea of another guy touching her. And again, I'm far from like the jealous guy. Like I'm cool with her pretty much doing whatever, as long as it's not banging other dudes. Uh, you don't get that at all. Um, no, but I think we, I think we just like our, it's like a fundamentally different view. I think of like stuff, I guess. Like, I don't really view my partner as like, like, oh my God, like that's my partner. Like I have like my little life journey. I share it with her. It's super cool. She loves me. I hope she does. I love her. Um, yeah. And then we're kind of like on that journey. I don't feel like any amount of possessiveness. Like if she wants to go off and do shit, like she can do that. If she wants to travel, do whatever, like that's cool. If we want to do stuff together, we do that. That's cool. But, um, yeah, I just, I'm not like a big, like possessive kind of person. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not either. Like I'm definitely on the less extreme version of that. Like I'm definitely like the opposite of possessive in some ways but like you know so like for example she wants to travel totally cool with me she travels a lot uh Uh she wants to you know hang out with her girlfriends she wants to go out uh you know i don't even like if she's at a bar and there's another dude hitting on her i don't really care as long as she doesn't go home with him right or she doesn't like you know actively flirt back like i'm not one of those guys that's gonna get hung up like oh like you know if i'm at a bar with her and i go to the bathroom and i see some guy come up to her and try to talk to her i'm not gonna try to fight him or get combative you know i'm just gonna be like hey man what's up you know like I, you know like it's not a big deal to me at all but like, mm-hmm. like the idea of her like i guess fucking another guy that's where like my comfort limit is you know that's true yeah, which i think is like pretty normal that's yeah. like a super normal thing but i'm curious like why is she okay with you hooking up with other people uh well because she's happy so i don't think uh, a relationship has to be necessarily fair it just has to be you know both people have to be happy in it so she doesn't she told me many times she doesn't have the desire to have sex with other guys you know not to say that i'm like some kind of super superhero in bed or something like that no, i think i'm like fairly you know maybe a bit above average but she just says that she's like fully satisfied with like you know our sexual side or emotional side that she doesn't need those other guys and look like she's not i'm not saying she's like some kind of perfect girl although she's great like you know i'm sure she has occasionally when she's a good looking guy in the gym she has the urge uh but i guess the urge is not that strong uh you know and she knows that like you know the idea of me 
you know, the, for me, like I would not be okay with her fucking other dude because that would just like, you know, be repulsive to me in a lot of ways. So, you know, I think for her, the pros definitely outweigh the cons of that, like little curiosity that she gets. Uh, I don't think everything has to always be two way fair. It just has to mm -hmm. be acceptable. I mean, yeah, like, I agree with that 100%. Things, sometimes people make mistakes and they think that like a relationship has to be the same on both sides. But yeah. That's not true. People just have to be good with the arrangement of both sides. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of curious though, in terms of like how you view your partner with like, there's like not like an unhealthy level of jealousy or possessiveness, but like a pretty normal level. Does it yeah. make you think on the other end, do you ever worry that like maybe she doesn't love me as much as I love her because she seems to not be bothered when I'm off doing things with other girls like I would be if she was doing other things with men? No, because she shows her possessiveness in other ways. So meaning uh, for her, it would be unacceptable if I was to like start going on dates with other girls. Like I'm not talking about like one day getting a drink, but like we start, you know, like taking road trips together. Like that would be a hard no for her. Or if I start hanging out with one of my exes uh, without her being there, that would be unacceptable to her. Uh, or I start, you know, getting gifts for other girls or something like that. So there, she does have like definitely strong boundaries and limits. Uh, but that limit is, you know, because she 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 understands that I can have sex with random chicks and not form any kind of emotional connection with them. Girls are typically a lot worse than that. Some girls can do it, but more often than not, girls are pretty bad at just having completely isolated casual sex with no emotional connection whatsoever. So she kind of recognizes, you know, but yeah, there's definitely some things that would be deal breakers for her. Like if I told her, hey, you know, I've been talking to my ex, like she would get extremely, you know, uncomfortable with that. And that would be like, you know, hard no for her. Um, so no, for that reason, I don't really worry about that. Okay. I guess like a good example to kind of drive the point home about like things don't have to always be fair on both sides. Like if you take our little collaboration, for example, like you have a lot more subscribers than me, but I wouldn't say like if we can still collaborate together because, you know, we're, we're, it's still enough of like a discussion, right? So I like it doesn't always have to be fair on both sides. And I've actually, this is a pet peeve of mine with certain content creators who have like slightly more subs than me. And they're like, oh, well, why would I collab with you? I have 150,000, you have 100,000. I'm like, mm -hmm. really dude, like, does it have to be to that fucking like- I mean, some people are like clout monsters. So yeah, yeah, that's how they view it. They'll never collaborate with anybody smaller than them, yeah. Right, yeah. It's super bizarre to me, honestly. Um, oh, let me ask you from this question. What about from a purely pragmatic perspective? So let's just take your nature aside like pure pragmatism, mm -hmm. if your girl has the option of hooking up with other guys, that does increase the chance of the relationship ending because, you know, there's more of a chance that she could meet a guy that she likes more than you. So from a purely pragmatic perspective, would it not make sense to just not let her bang other dudes? No, I don't give a fuck. I feel really confident about who I am. If she doesn't like it, if she thinks she can find better, if she can go fucking go with somebody better, then fuck it. <laughs> I'll find another girl. Mm. Um, I think I, I think I'm a really unique person. I think mm. I have a lot of like really unique shit to offer. Um, mm. I'm also really hard to get along with too. I mean, like, there's it's not like all fucking sunshine and rainbows. But um, no, I'm like I'm not that worried that like she's gonna replace me. I think I'm I think I'm a pretty unique dude. So you come at it from a place of like pure abundance, basically. Is that what you're saying? Um, I don't know if I'd say abundance. I guess it's just like. Like if I felt like I was with a girl and if she had the chance to be with another guy, she would leave me. I don't think I don't think I'd feel any better. Like I'd be like, fuck, like she's basically here as my fucking prisoner. Like this doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> like so yeah, I don't I don't know. That's just the way that I feel. Like if you like I think I'm pretty good in bed. I think I can do stuff that I want to do like pretty well. <laughs> um if you feel like if you hook up with another dude, you can do better, you can do better shit, then fuck it. Then fuck me. I need to up my shit. I need to up my game, I guess. Um yeah, I don't know. That's my view it. Yeah, I do think you're probably wired in a different way than most people. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a not it's not like a normal way of thinking, and I wouldn't suggest most people do it or whatever. I understand you. Yeah. So you don't get this like like how open are you with your with your? You said you're married or you have? A yeah, we're married. Yeah. Okay. How open are you with like like for example, if she hooks up another guy, does she tell you about it? What's your level of communication on that? Um, I mean, some it depends on like what we're feeling. Like sometimes she likes to see videos of me with other girls. Sometimes I like to see videos for other guys um, or other girls, depending on what they're doing. It just super depends on like what we're doing. Um, sometimes I think the guys are like weird. I don't care. I don't want to see anything. I don't give a fuck. Um, sometimes we all like filming shit for each other. It's just like fun shit. Like it just depends on what's going on. Do you have like an OnlyFans or something? Or no, we've thought about it, but I'm still too like fatty. <laughs> Maybe give me like one more year of like lifting and I'll my big cut or whatever. We'll see. Okay. But so when like hypothetically speaking, your girl, your wife tells you like, yeah, you know, I had hooked up, like you don't get that like primal feeling of like disgust. Like that doesn't. It feels like emotion. really, I don't, I, again, like my experience is so far off than I understand, but like I get like pretty competitive. So like, if I feel like she had like a really good time with somebody, I think I usually want to like rise to the occasion. Like that makes me feel like, okay, well fuck. Like if you're saying this guy did this or that or whatever, that was fun. Like I can do that shit. Like I can do this at least as well as this guy. Um, so I think I usually like end up feeling competitive over it. 
which mm-hmm. I think is fun because that when that comes out like in a bedroom, like it's not like a, a competitive like I, you know I wake up and I fucking hate you or whatever. It's more like okay, cool, like well let's mess around, let's see like what was going on here, or whatever. Yeah. Because mm, to me, it would be like if that did happen, there would be like this primal feeling of like almost like disgust. Like you know, if you catch like one of your friends stealing from you, it's like dude, like really, like ugh. like it's like this weird primal feeling that's not really logical. It's just like this emotional thing. But again, I guess you and I are wired differently. So, okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's not too much to really say on that. Um, I mean, those are basically all the dating questions I had. The only other thing that I think you I think you and I largely agree on like 90, 95% of shit, uh, even politically, I think we largely agree. The mm-hmm. only thing I think you and I disagree on is COVID. But I don't know if you like really want to get into that. <laughs> I mean, if you want to. Um, I've read a lot of shit on the coronavirus and the vaccines. If that's if you want to go down that road, but I mean, we can we can. I'm, I'm debating though. Like, <laughs> guys, okay, let me know in the comments if you guys want to see this discussed for like 15 minutes. Uh-huh. Um, you want to see us debate COVID a little bit because I do think we have kind of a different perspective on that. Uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, but those are basically the main point I had when it comes to like relationships and dating. Uh-huh. Uh, I, mean, I kind of had a feeling that you and I would agree on a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't think there was actually anything that substantial. Okay, pretty much everyone is saying yes. So, um, what do you? I'm just curious on the dating stuff then, just to get a mm-hmm. little bit more into it. Like yeah. when you're talking on your channel, you're giving advice. What are like the two or three biggest tips that you give guys that are looking to like they're not haven't been in the dating market for a long time, they're trying to find a girl or whatever? Oh man, I mean that's like it's it's really it's it's like really hard to like narrow down to two or three. Don't you red really- pill guys always have like lists like top five ways to top two ways to? I thought that's what you guys did. Uh, well, so I'm, I don't, I'm talking about you a little bit. But no, yeah. I get it. No, I don't even really consider myself red pill. Uh, I like to think of myself as like a very nuanced individual. So I don't take like ideological positions based on what my team believes. I try to have a very nuanced perspective. Um, so it really depends on the guy and situation. But let's just take the act. Like let's just take a guy who just recently graduated from college. Maybe he was in a relationship in college. His girlfriend broke up with him. He's now single, uh, and he wants to get out there and meet some women. So I guess the first big piece of advice I would give that guy is put in a little bit of effort into, okay, the first one I would say is focus on leveling up your sexual market value as much as possible. So that means start going to the gym, get like a fresh haircut, go to a decent barber shop, get some decent clothes, get some good fashion. Uh, just do like the stuff like that that can be fairly, well, besides going to the gym, but all those stuff is pretty easy fixes, like going to a barber shop, fixing your fashion. That's pretty easy. Uh, that can make a difference. So just... Think of yourself as almost as like a brand and you want that brand. You don't want that brand to be McDonald's. You want it to be like more like, you know, a high end brand, like a BMW. Uh, So be careful how you present yourself. Uh, Uh The second thing is invest some time and energy into getting really solid photos, uh, you know, for Tinder and for Instagram. So uh, you don't have to go crazy with it, but try to get like some decent photos and you don't have to like get a professional photographer. You can just get your friends take photos of you. It's a little bit of a pain in the ass because most guys really hate taking photos. Pretty Uh much every guy I talk to. Uh, but you know, kind of get over that and try to just <laughs> like, I don't know, just fucking do it, even though it sucks, yeah. uh, cause it's going to be worth it. Uh, you know, you can't really half-ass online dating or, you know, that kind of stuff nowadays. Cause again, your competition is so stiff, uh-huh. uh, three practice going up and cold approaching women, like starting conversations with women organically at a grocery store at, you know, when you're walking your dog, when you're like at a bar, like practice talking to girls, you know, in, in like naturally in social situations and get those reps in like a lot of it is experience like if you haven't done it in like four years you're going to be rusty that's just like you know human nature uh those are like the very general ones i would give uh you know another big one is think of it try not to get emotionally attached to a girl before you meet her or before you even have hook up with her so meaning what a lot of guys do is they'll be like oh i'm talking to this perfect girl on tinder can you help me get her i'm like yeah bro but it's like some random chick you haven't met yet the odds are really small you should have 20 girls like that and then once you meet up with a girl and you start to like her sure you can form emotional attachments but don't get like attached to like a picture you saw on the internet like Mm -hmm. treat it try to separate your feelings from that and treat it more like sales where it's just a lead you know and then yeah you can build emotional attachments later uh so that that will kind of be my very general tips okay cool I'll give a cheat code. A uh, very attractive friend of mine. She says that uh, if you are a guy, if you're willing to make the sacrifice, go vegan. Because apparently in vegan communities, it's like 10 to 1 women to men. And it's really hard to find guys that are vegan. So if you're willing to make the dietary sacrifice, that might be an easy access for somebody. You can't find any women anywhere else. Hmm, interesting. It's 10 to 1 in the vegan community? I don't know. That's what she says. She lives in Seattle. So. Huh. 
Interesting. I, I know a few guys actually in the vegan community. I actually only know one girl in the vegan community. That's my ex. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Okay. I'd be, I'd be curious to see some statistics on that. Um, okay. I mean, is there anything I said that you necessarily disagree with or is there anything else you want to bring up about dating? Um, not that I can think of right now, no. Okay. Um, okay, let's let's just because uh, everyone's saying they want to see the COVID thing, so let's kind of touch on that. So sure. give me your give me your kind of position on you know the whole you know the the pandemic on vaccine mandates you know on all that, so I can understand your position better, and I'll tell you what we disagree on. Um, well, I don't. It's hard to say because I don't know where you're starting from. I think the coronavirus is real. I think it was a real. Yeah, virus. I agree with you on that. I think it's real too. Um, I think the advancement of mRNA technology was awesome. I super support those vaccines, the uh, Pfizer Moderna ones. Um, I think that I'm on the fence with vaccine mandates. I think I'm kind of okay with them, but politically it's a huge cost. So if I'm opposed to them, it's just because politically there's such a huge price to pay for it. Um, let me tell you my position. You can yeah, go for what it. What do you disagree with? So I also think coronavirus is real. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I mm -hmm. think vaccines work. Uh, you know, I think the COVID vaccine is working less, but still works. So I'm not, I'm not discounting vaccines. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I don't think the COVID thing is a hoax. I think it's a real virus. However, that being said, I think that the pandemic turned to something so much bigger than what needed to be. I think if you actually look at the statistics, COVID is not that particularly deadly, especially not to young, healthy people. Primarily it kills old people. Like vast majority of people who die are older people. And yes, there's exceptions. There's young, healthy people who died. But it's like that with flus and pretty much everything. Like if you actually look at some statistics in the U.S. alone, something like half a million people every single year die from uh, preventable medical errors. So that's like your doctor getting your medication wrong or like not performing the surgery properly. Half a million people every year. No one gives a fuck about that. Uh, but, you know, that's basically somewhat similar to what, you know, the COVID deaths have been. So I think there's been a lot of hip, uh, hypocr hypocrisy or whatever, what's the term, uh, hypocrisy uh, going on. And I think it largely, unfortunately, became about power and control uh, when it should have been about helping people. I think, again, there's so much hypocrisy, like, for example, uh, people insisting that you – you should, you know, you're you're fucking every, if you don't get the vaccine, you're hurting other people, you're hogging hospital beds, you should be forced to get the vaccine. But what about forcing fat people to go on a diet? Because if you're obese, you're 10x more likely, no, 100x more likely to hog a hospital bed. So I just feel like it's unfair to punish people for the choices they make. Like everyone has the right to decide what they want to inject and put in their body. And you know, who is another person telling me what to do? But I'm not against people doing it. Like my parents both got vaxxed and I think it was a good idea for them because they're a little older, they're more at risk. Uh, but yeah, so I think it largely became about power and control and turned into this whole big thing. And I think that if uh, we as a society didn't overreact to this extent, I think most of the damage was done not by the virus, but our reaction to the virus. Uh, all the shit that we did uh, in reaction to it and not so much the actual virus itself. I mean, I think that... This virus wasn't particularly deadly, but the problem wasn't the deadliness of the virus. The problem was the infectiveness, the infection, the infect, infectionness. What am I? What's the word? Infectivity? Inf inf infection rate or? Infection rate. Yeah, whatever. Of the virus. Um, it was highly infectious. Um, and I, I think that the issue is that like so many people were getting sick around the United States, like so many hospitals. Like if you talk to anybody that was working in hospitals in the past like two years, like it's been like fucking miserable um it's just been wall to wall like people like taking up like hospital beds like people on ventilators like people dying like just dumb shit like that i can understand the frustrations of medical professionals when you're getting like so many unvaccinated people pouring into these places when you're like okay well fuck like it's so easy to just get a shot like i understand that we can say that like well you know overweight people you know disproportionately represented hospital deaths and people that um you know don't work out and shit but like those are like major lifestyle changes to tell somebody like Hey, you need to like start working out and eating healthy. Like that's like a huge lifestyle change. Getting a vaccine is pretty easy. So, I mean, I'm empathetic to the medical professionals that are like just make people get vaccinated so we don't have to worry about this shit. Um, again, I can understand there's a great polit a political cost and people might not be comfortable with the implications of that. But um, yeah, I would in some ways argue that um, telling someone to get healthy is less extreme than telling someone to put a, a an injection in their body. I would well, it's not about it being extreme. It's like, what are the, what is the likelihood of you being able to do it? Right. Going to the pharmacy and getting injected is pretty easy. Um, I want to say, I read a stat once that if you get to the obese BMI, the chances of you ever returning to a healthy weight BMI, it's like 1.6%. Like it's really hard to go from obese to like healthy weight. Um, not to say that it wouldn't be good if people would do it. Like it would be phenomenal. Like, there's a ton of negative health outcomes associated with being obese, but it's just pretty hard. <laughs> 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think in some ways this was a missed opportunity. Um, and, I'll, and I think like the medical community largely has been also hypocritical in a lot of ways. Um, you know, you see like Fauci, for example, he's talking about the importance of vaccines. Uh, he personally takes something like 20 million or I think grams of vitamin D. Like he, he takes in one interview he revealed, he takes a lot of vitamin D because vitamin D is extremely essential for boosting your immune system. He'll never say it publicly. You know, he casually mentioned it in one interview. Um, you know, why not tell people, yeah, you know, guys, if you want to get the vaccine, do it. Also take vitamin D, take vitamin C, start working out, get some sleep. Don't burn your immune system. Stop eating shit. Um, there's a lot, huge missed opportunity for people to improve their overall health. And no, it was just, it just completely got mixed and just became, are you pro vaccine or are you not pro vaccine? When a vaccine is only one of the tools at our disposal to improve our overall health as a country. Yeah. I mean, it's cool to do that, but like we already tell people to do all that, right? It's not happening. Right. Nobody gets is, fat because they think that it's a good idea or nobody doesn't work out because they think it's good for their body. These are just like all lifestyle choices. And we've been telling people to do this for decades. Right. But the, it just doesn't it, like nobody does it. Like, so I feel like that idea of like, why don't we just tell everybody to get healthy? It's like, OK, well, <laughs> I mean, like, where does that get us at the end of the day? Right. The thing is, we don't really do that, though. Like, for example, Adele got fat shamed. I mean, she got skinny shamed when she lost weight. Like people were actively shaming her because she decided to get healthy. Right. Uh, I think that we used to do that, but we stopped doing that like five, 10 years ago. We do it to some extent, but not often. Now it's not considered a, you know, you're making a health choice. It's considered, oh, you're just not embracing my body. We just have a different body, you know, preference and you're fat shaming and all that. That's not really was ever a talking point 10 years ago. Uh, so I do, I don't think we actively encourage people to lose weight nearly as much as we used to and nearly as much as we should. Uh, almost never do you see, actually, I'm not going to say almost never, never do you see the mainstream medical community when it comes to COVID talking about the power of vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin D, scientifically proven to help improve your immune system. Almost never discussed. Importance of sleep, almost never discussed. It's all, it's all became about the vaccine. So I don't think we're doing nearly enough on that front. Uh, you I know, mean, I think... There was a there was a really good um, write up that I read a long time ago because um, I used to wonder this right like how many times is a doctor going to prescribe to you you know like heart medication when what you really need is just like diet and exercise you know and uh, there was a physician that posted a huge write up um, because because people would ask him this all the time and what he basically said was that like if I get a patient that comes into my office and they have like severe hypertension they have very high blood pressure um, you know and they're asking me to do something for them right then and right now. I can't tell the person just go diet and exercise. That would be the best thing that they could do for their health is diet and exercise. But when you're a doctor, they're, they're, when they're coming to you, you, they're already past that point. The, the onus is not on doctors to tell us that we need to diet and exercise. That's not their job. Doctors are there to make it so that you go from being sick to not sick. They're not there to take you from not sick to healthy. That's like a cultural push. It's not, that's not something the hospitals are going to do. You don't go to gyms and hospitals. You go to um, pharmacy areas of hospitals. You go to like uh, gynecologist offices or you go to oncology offices, right? You go there to not die, to not get sick. So, I mean, I can understand what you're saying that like there needs to be a greater emphasis on health and society, but I think that that's just a really hard thing to solve. Like, I'm pretty sure that like the fitness industry and all that shit is probably still booming. I'm pretty sure this is like million or not millions, probably billions or maybe even hundreds of billions of dollars a year. spent on like health related shit, fitness related shit across the world. Um, it's just a real, it's just when our lives are like more sedentary than they've ever been, when access to easy sugars are higher than they've ever been, when like all of this shit is coming together, our sleep sucks because we work too much because we've got screens in front of us all day. It's just a really fucking hard problem to solve, to just tell people to like take some vitamins, you know, get some rest and exercise a bit. If it was that easy, I think that everybody in the planet would do it. Like we can talk about too, about how this like, oh, there's the health at every size movement, like blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, there are a couple of these people. They're cringe as fuck. They're stupid. I agree with that. I think it's dumb. They shouldn't say shit. But like the average woman doesn't want to be a fat fuck. The average guy doesn't want to be a fat fuck. You know, these people might be fat. They might lie to themselves. But if they could flip a switch and be thin, they would do it 100%. It's just, it's a really hard journey for a lot of people in today's society, I think. Sure. I do think it, it's easier said than done. Uh, but like, for example, vitamins are pretty easy to do. It's pretty easy for everyone to take vitamin D and vitamin C. And that would, generally speaking, approve the outcome of uh, how we do as a country when it comes to viruses and just shit in general. 
but it's almost never talked about. Like, I, so I've heard this one a lot. Okay, I don't know if you're on like the super C doses, like a thousand milligrams a day or whatever, like the big vitamin D stuff. Um, all the medical studies I've ever seen regarding vitamin stuff, supplementation is important if you're deficient, but like the huge, like super dosing of like vitamin C, vitamin D shit. I don't think that actually helps you if you're sick. Um, I know that a lot of people have been trying to put it in like different care regimens for treating different viruses. You might get some in a hospital if your virus or if you're um, vitamin deficient, but to my understanding, there haven't been any large scale studies showing that like just, you know, giving people vitamin or whatever is be an effective treatment to a virus like by the time you're sick it's already too late like you've gotten sick like now your immune system is what's kicking in and taking over like all the vitamin d or c in the world assuming you're not deficient isn't really gonna help you at that point yeah so here's the thing on that i have actually a pretty good explanation on that so uh when it comes to oral absorption of vitamins there's an inherent limit of how much you can absorb so meaning like if you get covid and you start popping a lot of vitamin c you're gonna just poop and piss it out most of it it's there's a limit to how much you can absorb However, if you do high dose vitamin C IV intravenously, uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of merit to that. I can tell you when I had COVID, uh, you know, I was, it wasn't bad for me. I mean, but I did lose my sense of smell and taste. Uh, I just couldn't smell shit, couldn't taste shit. Uh, I did a high dose vitamin C IV. About five hours later, my nose opened up. I got 50% of my sense of smell back. Did it again. Next day, pretty much got most of my taste back. I can tell you, uh, and this sounds anecdotal, but I've had over 10 friends who I've pushed to do the high-dose vitamin C IVs, and they've all seen radical results, like 25 grams of vitamin C intravenously. My roommate could barely get out of bed. He was so fucked up with COVID. He's a lot less healthy than me. He was like fucking like close to dying, uh, you know, like maybe like one level before going to the hospital. We ordered an IV person to come to the house because he literally couldn't get out. Uh, did 25 grams of vitamin C intravenously. Next day, he was like 70, 80% better. He was already walking around. Um, in China, actually, one of the big treatments they do is high-dose vitamin C and ozone. Uh, it's just in America, we don't really do much of that. It's considered alternative medicine. But in a lot of places across the world, high-dose vitamin C is not considered alternative. It's considered, you know, like mainstream treatment because it fucking works. And there's pretty much no downside to it. So this may sound anecdotal, but I can tell you there's been at least a dozen people who I've personally seen do high-dose vitamin C when they had COVID, and they got radical improvements. I mean, if there were studies showing it, I'd believe it. But as of right now, just, yeah, I mean, it's just people's stories. Yeah, I don't know what to say. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think studies, I think we have a tendency as people to, uh, especially like people who are smarter, and more intellectual, kind of like me and you, to really try to defer to studies. But I think studies in a lot of ways are uh, limited, uh, meaning, you know, study has to be funded and there has to be placebo control groups. And sometimes it's not practical to get studies for certain things. Um, so I think we do need to, we need to be able to make assumptions and conclusions without a study sometimes. And I think that's okay. Like we don't need a study. Like I think sometimes a certain amount of anecdotal evidence is enough. Like I don't need a study telling me that, for example, that uh, chicks don't like guys who try to show off. Uh, you know, I know enough guys who've tried to show off in front of girls and see it not work that, you know, I can take that as a fact. Uh, no, I mean, that's kind of my take on that. Um, yeah, I guess the, the hardest thing is that like, it's because we can't see what would have happened otherwise when it comes to anecdotes. That's always the problem, right? When it comes to like guys that show off, right? Like we can see what happens when guys do show off. We can see what happens when they don't show off. We can run the same experiment over and over again. Anecdotally, we don't think we're running experiments. We're watching the same thing happen anecdotally to kind of figure out what's happening. The problem is that like for everybody that you know and you, including you, that took vitamin C and got better, if you didn't take vitamin C, maybe you would have gotten better anyway, right? Like that's always like the hard part to tell anecdotally. Sure. It's why, yeah. Um, but it's it's the it's the like rate of improvement. Yeah, I, I think I'm healthy enough that I would have gotten better anyway. But the mm -hmm. question is how fast would it have happened? Like for example, I think my example is not that good because I wasn't that sick, but like taking my roommate who was like in bed for four days, like like really fucked up, like and then he does an IV and then like literally within twelve to twenty four hours he's like eighty percent better, seventy percent better. Uh that is like pretty telling. And then when I see that happen with a dozen people you know, then I'm like, okay, maybe there's something to high dose vitamin C IV, uh, you know, why it helps. Uh, What's yeah. keeping like doctors from like all over the fucking world from just doing this then? Why doesn't like so, everybody just do this? Yeah. So that's a good question. So it's not, uh, all across the world. There's countries where this is being done. I think the American medical industry in some ways is very advanced in some ways is very backwards. Uh, one is a lack of education. Uh, like I have a lot of doctor friends and so I like, I'm pretty good insight on this. They're just not taught this like in, in medical school, they're not really, it's considered alternative or even like frowned upon or shamed upon as like uh, pseudoscience or whatever. Uh, they're not taught this in medical school. They're taught like, you know, like medication, prescriptions, 
And there's this idea, I think, with a lot of doctors that if it's not like coming from, you know, a pharmacy, that's like alternative or it's not real. Uh, I think there's a huge profit motive in Western medicine, which is very unfortunate. I mean, in a lot of ways, doctors have become almost like drug dealers, where like basically pharmaceutical reps, they petition doctors and they say, hey, uh, you know, I want you to carry our drug and we'll give you this and this and this in exchange. And doctors quite often are like, okay, sure, I'll do that. So uh, I think there's a lot of issues that go on with Western medicine. And uh, quite often there's the profit motive really fucks with it. And I'm not saying that I think having universal healthcare is the solution. Probably not. I'm not like, you know, pushing for that. But there is a huge issue here with the profit motive and lack of education. And uh, and also the medical, you know, like the phrase uh, uh, t- tyranny of the majority. This is what the founding fathers were worried about is that like when you have a major- like group think, you have a whole bunch of people who think the same way and you're a dissenting opinion, you get kind of stigmatized and chained. So quite often doctors are really weary of like trying anything new or going outside of you know the you know what's considered the established perspective and with covid especially because it's so sensitive doctors are even more weary because they don't want to like be stigmatized it's like oh this is the crazy you know fucking crock doctor that's prescribing vitamin c for something as serious as covid uh so there's a whole bunch of issues there i understand the desire to like see through like I think that we like to, as humans, I think it's fun to see like overarching narratives um, to try to describe some things that exist in life. But I think sometimes the simple answer is just the answer. Um, we don't go to doctors for like nutrition advice or for workout advice because I, it's just that's just not in the purview of what their job is. They're not there to coach us through like diet and exercise. I'm pretty sure that like any doctor that's gone through medical school will know plenty about the human body, plenty about nutrition. They'll know plenty. They'll be able to tell you things like if you exercise, you'll have to worry about this less and less. If you have a well-balanced diet, you'll, like I, I'm pretty sure like every doctor studies this and knows is probably way better than the average person does. Um, it's just the issue is that like if you're a surgeon or if you're working in, you know, like radiology or whatever, like you're past the point of making these recommendations to people, you know, like uh, uh, somebody that works in oncology might know a million different things that give you cancer. But by the time you've got somebody showing up with like stage three, you know, like small cell lung cancer in your office, it's not time for you to say like, well, you know, maybe, sir, if you smoked a little bit less and you um, ate more antioxidants, your body, like it's too late at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that we like to blame pharmaceuticals and, and drug prescriptions or whatever from hospitals because that it's, it's like a convenient scapegoat for our problems. But I feel like sometimes it's largely just a way to absolve the population from the responsibility. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. Um, to resolve the population from uh, the responsibility of like taking care of ourselves. It, it like feels good or it feels nice that we can like blame pharmaceuticals for, you know, fucking all of our lives up. But I mean, diet and exercise is literally within everybody's reach. Everybody knows that it's good for you. Um, people still don't do it for whatever societal pressure. I don't think it's fair to blame like the pharmacies or to blame hospitals or physicians for uh, like kind of where the culture is headed. I don't, I don't necessarily agree that they're in that direction. Um, yeah, I, I understand the, the push for it sometimes because maybe it seems a little bit weird, but I mean, like we made a lot of great strides in terms of medicine, in terms of things we treat. Yeah. Um, I mean, people that, you know, have diabetes today are doing a lot better with the insulin we've developed today as opposed to the past. If you have AIDS today, you have the same lifespan, or if you have HIV, you have the same lifespan now as a normal person. Uh, Like we've basically completely treated HIV, which is awesome. A lot of people don't even know that. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I know that some people like to demonize pharmaceuticals sometimes, but I, I don't think that the blame is there for societal ills when it comes to health and nutrition and stuff. Well, I think there's plenty of blame to go around. I mean, I think part of the blame we can certainly say is with the pharmaceuticals. Part of the blame is with people being lazy. Part of the blame is with the culture. I think there's plenty of it to go around. I kind of have an interesting perspective on this because uh, when I was, <clears throat> well, like 24, 23, I got Lyme disease. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Lyme disease, but it's like one of the most frustrating things ever because uh, there's really bad testing for it. Uh, and there's bad treatment for it, and a lot of doctors are not familiar with it. And I had a very unpleasant experience of going to dozens, if not close to 100 doctors, over and over again and being misdiagnosed and misdiagnosed and giving wrong treatment and wrong drugs. And like when you do go through something like that, you realize how incompetent the average doctor is. It's, it's mind-blowing. I think it's one of those things that you kind of have to experience, but it's mind-blowing how incompetent the average doctor is. Now, look, there's some when good you doctors say- out- just curious, when you say Lyme disease, you mean like you were like bit by a tick and you got Lyme disease? Mm-hmm. Or are you talking yeah. about like yeah. I got I got bit by a tick, had Lyme okay. disease, went untreated. Um, didn't start treatment until I was about a year or two years after having it. So it became chronic at that point. Uh, 
once, then, once I thought that that was like a like the bacterial infection that you kind of had for a little bit. It, so really... Ly so Lyme is pretty easy to treat if you is pretty easy to treat if you treat it pretty fast. So if you get Lyme disease and you start treatment within like a month, it's uh -huh. pretty straightforward. Just take a month or two of doxy and you're good. Uh, if it goes untreated for a long period of time, it becomes very mm, entrenched in your body and your immune system and becomes really, really hard to treat. You have to do a whole combination of antibiotic protocols, rotating antibiotics, herbs, lifestyle changes. It becomes really, really tricky the longer it goes on train, uh, on, on whatever, on, uh, untreated. Uh, it's super fucking annoying. It's often ignored in the – Joe Rogan actually had a podcast about it recently, which was really good to see. Mm -hmm. um, but so the point I'm making is it's it's so – it's mind-blowing how incompetent a lot of doctors are and how knowledgeable. Like I've literally had infectious disease doctors tell me, hey, man, I am convinced you don't have Lyme disease. It's got to be something else. I was like, are you sure? Maybe you should test me for it. No, nah, man, no chance. Like no chance. Like for, for quite a while, no one wanted to test me for it. Uh, so, yeah, that's like, that's like a big thing that I personally experienced. What's interesting, though, is there's a whole new community of doctors called functional medicine. Are you familiar with that? Nope. Functional medicine is like a movement, philosophy, different approach, but it's a little different than traditional medicine. The goal isn't – the goal is basically to get to the root cause of the problem to first accurately diagnose it and then treat it using the best available methods without any regards to like whether it's Western, Eastern, common, not common. It's like – Let's get to the underlying, underlying root of the problem and just attack it from all fronts and just do what's most effective. So maybe that's antibiotics. Maybe that's lifestyle changes. Maybe that's vitamins. Let's approach it holistically and try to get you better, right? That's not actually how a lot of Western medicine works. It's really not. But functional medicine is becoming more and more popular because that's what's actually helping people. So it wasn't until I started working with functional medicine doctors that actually, you know, started getting figured out what the issue was and then start treating it, you know, started feeling better. Uh, you know, so, you know, I think that functional medicine evolved largely because, well, traditional medicine was failing a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Gotcha. Okay. And I think it's pretty um, telling that half a million people every single year in the U.S. die from preventable uh, medical errors. I I don't really I don't want to like dig into that. I I know where that number comes from, but it's I don't think that's true. Um uh I think Peterson brought that up on a podcast episode, I remember, and it's it oftentimes gets thrown around that that is what's happening just due to like medical mishap. I want to say he said 200,000, but it might have been half a million a year. I, but I I pretty sure that number is completely over exaggerated. I don't think that's necessarily true. But um, that's like a whole digging through like studies. Yeah, I'd have to. I'll be honest. I'm not too familiar with the study. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's John Hopkins. So I kind of took them at their word because John mm -hmm. Hopkins is like pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really dig through the study. So I can't like really comment on that too closely. Sure. Uh, but yeah. Might uh, be worth like an answer, but yeah. 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 Uh, but I mean, I think that's basically it when it comes to that. I don't even think we radically disagree on that much uh, when it comes to this. I just like, how are you for like, like, what do you think about, like, you know, government telling businesses they have to close down and, like, you know, you can't be open, you have to close your business? Like, how do you feel about that? I mean, I think that for some period of time, I thought that that was acceptable. Like, like I said, like, it was a really infectious disease. Like, our hospitals have been getting slammed for years with a lot of unvaccinated people. Um, we already had, like, what is it, like a million people die in the past couple of years from the disease. I think it was probably okay to, to pump the brakes on everything. Yeah, I think doing it for a small period of time was okay, but I think, you know, it's pretty telling that you have like, you know, like let's take uh, California and Florida, right? Actually, mm -hmm. you're a good example of this. Like you moved, you know, recently to Florida. Uh, mm -hmm. You live in California. I was the same way. I used to live in California. Like since COVID, like California has radically gone downhill. Like, you know, a lot of places went out of business that have been around for hundreds of years. A lot of like, you know, people left California, moved to places where there's more liberal policies. So conservatives, and I'm not conservative at all. I'm actually probably a little bit more on the left. But states, conservative run states like Florida, who have much more lenient restrictions, uh, and Texas and Nevada have done like substantially better than like blue states like California and New York in terms of pretty much everything. I'm pretty Even, sure that when you rank like the top 10 states that have gotten fucked by the virus, I think like eight or nine of them are conservative. Um, New York got fucked initially because it's like the hub for international travel around the world, right? So, I mean, I understand New York got fucked up initially, but I'm pretty sure that when you look at the rankings of like all the states that had the most deaths and infections and everything due to the coronavirus, I, like I said, I want to say that like, I, I think of the top 10, it's like either eight or nine are conservative. And like of the top 15, I'm pretty sure like 12 or 13 are conservative states, like the statistics on it are actually quite interesting, but like a state like California did pretty much equal to, if not slightly worse than a state like Florida. 
Uh, so like if you look at it statistically, there was not like the states that where everything was closed down didn't really perform or do any better than a state that pretty much stayed open. Because uh, in a lot of ways also like even like some of the restrictions were in common sense. Like, for example, uh, okay, for the gym, let's make the gym only open 8 to 5 p.m. Like my building did that. But that encourages more people to like work out at the same time, right? So a lot of these restrictions were actually just making the problem worse in a lot of ways. Like let's force everyone to like let's close a lot of shit down so people have to stay inside. Well, the virus really, you know, gets transmitted much more inside than outside. So a lot of these like restrictions actually in some ways potentially made the situation worse. But from a statistical perspective, like – the blue states did not do better in terms of health outcomes than red states. On okay, so I'm just like kind of like digging through just because I'm curious. Like looking at like California, like the California deaths per 1 million population was 2,264. For Florida, it was 3,425, like almost 50% worse. Is, is that from Corona? Um, yeah, I'm looking from the coronavirus. Yeah, that's a that's over a 50% increase in deaths. 2,264 to 3,425. Let me, let, me, let me take a look because I've actually seen some statistics on this. Or diverse. You know, the interesting thing about statistics is they can be manipulated for pretty much any which way. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me take a look at this. I'm just looking at deaths per 1 million people. Uh, okay, wait. LA Times, that's going to be biased. Let me try to find like a neutral. Okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, okay, let's... I think most public health would sample homelessness makes me realize that I didn't this. Like, I'm just going to read. Here's like the top 10 states' deaths per 1 million, right? Top 10. So number one is Mississippi, then Arizona, Alabama, Tennessee, West Virginia, New Jersey, Arkansas, Louisiana, Michigan, Oklahoma, then New York, Georgia, New Mexico, Indiana, uh, like Pennsylvania is blue. South Carolina, Florida, Kentucky. Like, I, it seems like of the top 20, I feel like 15 of these states are pretty solidly red states. Um, just looking at like the deaths for 1 million people. But yeah, but like if you look at different types of statistics, like I'm looking at this, and it's like Florida new cases of COVID 19 are roughly four times lower than those of California data from the Centers of Disease Control, so CDC. So it's pretty reliable. As of November 9, the CDC reported a seven day average case of 1470. Uh, 1,470 in Florida and 6,297 in California. And I'm not going to deny that the vaccine works and people die less if they get vaccinated. I think part of that, you know, is the fact that, you know, a lot more people in California are vaccinated than Florida. So maybe less people die. But in terms of like the virus spreading, uh, it seems like, you know, if you go by this statistic, which is from the CDC, so it's probably pretty reliable uh, that, you know, it's spreading more in California despite the restrictions than Florida, which is like, you know, pretty open. Um, I mean, maybe, but I could start by like total cases per 1 million population. Um, and like my top states are, we got Rhode Island, then Alaska, North Dakota, Tennessee, Kentucky, Utah, South Carolina, West Virginia, Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Wisconsin, Iowa. I mean, but another interesting thing that you have to consider is, okay, what about the people who die from drug overdose because they became like there's there was like a huge rise in like uh, heroin and prescription use because uh, people became depressed and blah, blah, blah. So like I think it's also important to consider like, you know, I think like for me, if like a loved one dies from COVID or they die from like drug overuse, it's equally mm -hmm. bad. So I think like you have to consider, okay, what about, you know, what yeah, I agree. There's like other case of deaths, but like yeah. people try to account for this when they look at something. There's a there's a statistic called excess deaths where they try to measure the overall amount of like excessive deaths in a society. And by those measures, like the chances are we've undercounted how many people died from the coronavirus. Like excess deaths are massively up. It's not like we got a whole bunch of people more killing themselves because they were inside and that like somehow overcame like the amount of people dying due to the coronavirus. Like Here's, here's I think a lot of people, I think, I think the coronavirus killed a lot of people. <laughs> like we kind of, we don't talk about it. We're kind of like moved on now because there's other stuff going on. But like a million people died in the United States. Like a really bad flu season in the U.S. I think is like 70 to 80,000 people maybe dead. Yeah, That's a yeah. really bad flu season. And we're putting up like big six figure numbers every year for the coronavirus, which is pretty crazy. That's pretty. I mean, there was definitely a big health pandemic, but the question is, what's the right response to it? I'm looking mm -hmm. at an article right now from New York Post, which is obviously, you know, a fairly reliable news source. Like you would say, that's like conservative leaning. It says without mandates or lockdowns, Florida uh, better match COVID than New York. Um, 
And yeah, New York is like always the go-to comparison. In my head, that always feels a little bit disingenuous because New York is the place that got hit the hardest when COVID happened. But I think New York, if you if we want to be honest when we analyze New York, um, you can just go and look up like the case infection rate and everything and the case fatality rate. Look it up like when it was first discovered and then after they started taking lockdown measures. And you can watch the cases fall off a cliff because as soon as they start locking down and figuring out what's going on, like, yeah, people stop getting infected. So I think it's okay to look at New York as a test case, but to compare New York to other places, um, when you've got D DCA, JFK, like the, like all these international airports are like like in New York. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, but there's, there's, there's an important thing I just realized in this article. Uh, so you, another thing we have to look at is how many the in, in each state. What is the percentage of elderly people that live there? Because we all know that COVID affects elderly a lot more. So this this is talking about. Uh, Florida has only the 33rd highest age-adjusted COVID-19 deaths rate per 100,000 population. So age-adjusted. So I do think that's why what the data you pulled up is saying, yes, there's more deaths in Florida. That's true. But everyone knows that a bunch of old people live in Florida and move down here. So Florida has a significantly larger population of old people. So I think we have to look at it as age-adjusted COVID deaths. Well, what is the California age-adjusted population? Uh, California is... This puts the same ballpark as Mandate Heavy Illinois ranked 32 and California ranked 38 uh, at Bologna. Okay, so it's oh, no, like they're not that far apart, right? Yeah, they're basically right at the same at the same part. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And then also, uh, I don't. If Florida anything, that feels like it'd be an even stronger argument than that Florida should have adopted stronger mandates. So they've got so many old people, right? Like that's like saying maybe, that like a virus maybe. came into a hospital. Are we going to lock down? And it's like, well, and then you don't lock down, and you have a whole bunch of kids die because they all have leukemia. And you're like, oh well, oh, come on, they all had leukemia. Of course they were going to die. Well, no, that means you should have taken even better care of them. They have fucking leukemia, right? I feel like the same argument we made for maybe. Florida. You've got a bunch yeah. of like fat, overweight old people. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe. Oh. Maybe. Uh, but I think the, the you know the initial thing we're discussing is whether the van mandates really helped or not. Um, so it's just interesting to see that like when you do age adjusted type of stuff, a state like California, which was went really heavy on the mandates, you know, didn't really perform any significantly better than a state like Florida. But I would argue that you know Florida, in terms of freedom of quality of life and like business and economic prosperity, did a lot better than California. You know, California right now is like basically a shithole like homeless people have taken over like half of LA. you know a lot of businesses are closed there's huge unemployment a lot of people are leaving uh there's a huge deficit problem versus florida is like blooming in a lot of ways a lot of businesses are relocating here the tech industry is blooming in miami uh so you know i would make the argument I think that, that california has a lot of problems that like i don't think that the coronavirus made homeless people show up in california right um I, like, well, I'm going to agree that California has a lot of problems, obviously. That's totally true. But I, I don't know if these just came about because of the coronavirus. Like, people leave, people were leaving California before the coronavirus happened. That shit place is hella fucking expensive. But I mean, like, I, I, like, I feel like Miami is going to be close behind. Miami, I think I got here at, like, the worst time. This place has gotten fucking expensive, too. Like, mm -hmm. I'm paying 3500 a month for a two-bedroom apartment sure. that is, like, 800 Dude, I pay 6000 a month for a two-bedroom. Okay. Well, yeah, it sounds like you're, like, in a downtown, like, nice area or some shit. But, like, <laughs> um, it's getting, like... I'm not in an area that I should be paying that much. It's a decent area, but like, no, right. that's insane. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, like every city in the U.S. having huge like booms and rent and shit. Like, th there are definitely problems. I agree. I don't know if they were all caused by the coronavirus, but yeah. Yeah, no, there's definitely problems in California way before COVID. I 100% will grant that. Uh, but I think the problems got expeditedly a lot worse. Like, it really like the if they call it the California Exodus, that mm -hmm. really started like becoming a thing after COVID. Uh, it was happening to a small degree, but it became mm -hmm. like degrees worse uh and i think it kind of like okay like from a perspective of like a successful business person like you have your own business uh mm -hmm. you live in uh you know fucking you know like la right like you're gonna pay extra taxes because california has a state income tax mm -hmm. uh and everything is closed and you can't enjoy anything like why would you stay there like why would not you move to a place where you can pay less taxes and have more freedom you know, so it like made no sense at that point for like basically anyone who has disposable income to stay. But if you're someone who doesn't have money and you rely on the government, then you can't really move. Uh, you know, you don't have that luxury. So, you know, I do think that COVID made the issue a lot worse of California. Um, yeah, I mean, it definitely exacerbated some problems. I'm not going to say that's not true yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, okay. I think we kind of more or less covered this topic. Sure. Um, you have anything else to add on that? Um, not that I can think of, no. Yeah, so let me know in the comments if you want to see me and Destiny do a part two debate where we just discuss politics. <laughs> sure.
Could be interesting. I I, re, I almost never. You might actually, you know, have a lot more experience with that than me because I almost never debate politics. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever done it. I've done it only once on this channel. Mm-hmm. So um, it'd be interesting. But if you guys want to see that, let me know in the comments. People are like, nah, that's boring. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, the problem is like when it comes to women, I don't think we disagree on too much. Sure. I think the difference is mainly in our background. Uh, meaning like, I think you're, again, I know you don't like that word, but you're much more of like a natural. So a lot of the stuff for you is more intuitive. Like, I don't think you've really had to like sit down or like think about strategy and stuff. I think for you, it was largely intuitive versus for me, it was a lot more external and I had to like kind of develop it later on in life. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that was like kind of the, uh, I don't know, the source of the discrepancy between our philosophies, but I think largely we came to a lot of the same conclusions, which is interesting. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, listen, if anything ever comes up in the future, uh, you can always shoot me an email or whatever. And yeah, sounds good. Yeah, man. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So guys, uh, check out Destiny's channel. Is there anything you want to promote or plug? Uh, I'm youtube.com slash destiny. Yeah. Cool, man. Cool. All right. uh, hopefully I get that blue check mark soon so I can get the chicks DMing me. Yeah. Good luck, I don't have man. to fuck with Tinder anymore. Yeah. You just applied for it and you just got it? Yeah. You just apply and you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they must have thought you were like important enough, I guess. Yeah, if you have a business account that you can like link a site or whatever, then maybe if you like if you have a ver could you, is your YouTube verified? Um my YouTube, that's when you hit hundred K, right? Uh I don't know, to get a check mark on YouTube or whatever. Yeah, that's when you hit hundred K. I'm coming up. Okay. Yeah. Well when you get hundred K, maybe you can fucking I think you might be able to just use that because if you're verified on another platform, it might make it easier too. So Yeah. The the YouTube check mark is a little different than all than Twitter and Instagram. YouTube is just covers like once you hit hundred K, bam, versus mm-hmm. Instagram and Twitter, there's no like amount of subs that you need to get before you oh yeah no what i mean is that like if you have a check mark on youtube you might be able to link that in your application and right, they'll okay. approve you on instagram is what i mean because they you show you have other big accounts or whatever yeah cool all right man thanks so much for coming on i appreciate it, it was a really good discussion yeah, oh no as a problem. side note i want to ask you this uh kind of on a personal note uh you know a guy named isaac he told me that he was like uh, yeah. he, Sorry, he sort ahead. of knows you he, he wants to like i don't know like discuss have a debate with you or something are you joking or no, I'm serious. Like, yeah, I don't is know if he, he has uh, like bad is personal he a, history. Is he a vegan? Yeah, yeah, I know this guy. We, we, he's, he's like an okay dude. It's just that's just not a community that I tend to hang out with. No, I feel like in a lot of ways it would be in line with your values. No, like, um, no, nah, fuck animals. I don't give a fuck about vegans. Okay, we're animals. I'll eat them all and kill them all and torture them all. Fuck them. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like the the vegan community tends to be left leaning. Uh, mm-hmm. But okay, yeah, I felt like I would bring that up. Um. Well, if you change your mind. Cool. Okay. Well, hey, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. Cool, man. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it, man. Mm-hmm. All right, man. Take care. Have a good one.